If you see these three things, it's almost positive that the person you're looking at is on steroids. You, you want to guess? <laughs> oh, I, can't, I can't wait for these. <laughs> you know, um, I love when people post videos on YouTube or whatever, and it's like, you know, natty or not. And it's like, you know, they try to figure it out. I mean, such uh, a genre. You have Greg Duchette and you have. Uh, What's more, plates, his name? more dates? Uh, Derek? Yes, that have yeah. built an entire brand yes. out of uh, calling people out. Now, granted, yeah. I I think they the reason why they've gotten as big as they are is they do a pretty good job. Although I have seen examples, by the way, yeah, where they were uh, wrong, where they are wrong. And I think I know where you're going with this. Uh, I'm assuming because I think we're all on the same page of this because we've had this conversation before, which is there are none. Yeah, because I can give you for every example you give to me that you're like, it is so obvious this person's on steroids. I'll show you another person yeah. who isn't on steroids that you would swear is or vice versa. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that and I've I, I've I, been wrong so many times that I know better same. to judge or care. Yeah, same. I'll, so, I'll start yeah. by saying this. Look, if you're selling products and fitness based off of um, your the fact that you're natural and this is how I built my physique, and you're not, that's, that's, I get that. Like, that's, you're, you're lying uh, to sell a product. So I get why that would piss people off. But it's, besides that, it, it's really hard to tell. And, and of course, if you're a pro bodybuilder, okay, it's only extreme, extreme cases, like a pro bodybuilder walks by, 5'9", 260 pounds shredded. Yeah, you probably. <laughs> that's a bit of a giveaway. Probably. But I've seen some of the craziest genetics on people. And then I've seen people take, enough steroids to choke a horse and almost look like they didn't even work out worse. Yeah. They didn't even look like they work out. So like a, a good example is like, we'll talk about the, the most, the, the most winning Mr. Olympia of all time, Ronnie Coleman. I think he won eight Mr. Olympias and this is well established, well ex ex uh, uh, accepted in the bodybuilding space. He was a top 10 Mr. Olympia competitor naturally for years. Yes. He competed. He was a pro bodybuilder and competed naturally and did top 10 in the world natural maybe doug can find some pictures of him and by the way like what he looked like naturally i never achieved on the biggest doses of gear in my life i, I like, couldn't if i you just, could put me on anything you want and that's why this is such a such a silly conversation is because more importantly somebody's uh genetic propensity for <laughs> muscle and their diet and training plays a bigger factor and that's not to discount that anabolics play, can play a can play a big role, right. but they're not as big as those other things. If somebody trains really well and has the genetics to build muscle and they understand nutrition, that person could get a long, so long to the point of Ronnie Coleman that he can compete with the best in the world at the pro level at bodybuilding naturally. Now the story goes that he, yeah. I think he got tenth in the Olympia, and I, I think it was uh, Kevin Lavroni. There he is. Look, is it, it, by, by the way, that's a teenager on the left. That's him as a teenager. It's he natural. That's a they, teenager right there. Huh? Yeah. Yes, bro. Yeah, that's yeah, natural. Yeah. That's natural. Wow. Now, if you now when you when he went on gear, <laughs> I mean, nuts. he looked a lot like bigger. Well, of course, right? yeah. But, but I look mean, at that. Still, like the base of what he's got to work with. Is you know, okay. There's a good picture there on the right, Doug, uh, uh, where you see yeah, natural versus not natural. So obviously, a lot bigger. Yeah. But naturally, crazy, crazy. Crazy, absolutely yes. crazy, and 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 you're also looking at him completely lean down and dice up. I bet in the off season of natural, he looked like a beast. Yes, yeah. absolutely, had to be a beast. And I no, I've seen people. So you know, working in gyms as long as as we have, um, you know, I remember I had one guy who was he was a porter, so he you know he cleaned the gym, and the guy was just Jack. And I thought, oh, he's he's got to be on something. Uh -huh. And then I realized he lived in his car, and he ate pop tarts. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, how was he that big? Crazy genetics. Here's how I know it was crazy genetics on top of it. Because, uh, as I was working in this club, I would start buying him lunch here and there. And I remember, I, saw, I, I mean, it was like, I could see him growing right before me. If he ate a decent lunch, like five days in a row, it looked like he gained five pounds of muscle. He had some of the craziest bodybuilding genetics I've ever seen. Then, Justin, Justin worked alongside somebody yeah. like this, right? I know you have to remember oh, yeah. Jerry. I, Jerry, absolutely. I used to drive him to work because he always had problems with his car and all this kind of stuff. And uh, really nice guy, but like he would eat like McDonald's, Taco Big Bell, Macs like and, twice a day too. He eat yeah. like twice a day. One of the meals would be food. McDonald's or Taco Bell. Yeah. He was older too. So he, he was in his 30s shredded, when we were in our 20s right? yeah. and he was shredded. Yeah. Shredded, shoulders, arms, yeah. all natural. Veins. Just all natural. Yeah. And, and then like, just- dude, 
And then years later, I, for sure I had a gym in, in, in the Palm Springs area, which is close to Mexico. So I'd have trainers that would drive down to Mexico all the time, buy steroids, come back. And I'll never forget uh, one of my sales guys. I won't say his name because people know who he is. He went down with some of my, my trainers. He's like, I'm going to get on, you know, I'm going to get on some gear. And I'm like, whatever, you know, you teach their own. He went down there, came up, and they all got on all this these anabolics together. Now, you could tell that the trainers were on stuff. You could not tell. He was using the same stuff. In fact, he was using so much. I remember at one point he was telling me how much because he kept upping it. And he's like, I think mine is fake. I'm like, it's the same stuff that they're using. And all that happened to him was he got puffier and redder and he just looked like he got worse health. And I've seen a lot of guys like this that, that they're, they're on anabolics and you, it well, doesn't even look like it. Now, that's not to say that they don't work, but there's obvious signs like a pro bodybuilder, but then the rest are not that obvious. And you'll see people... That you won't believe. Uh, that was really eye opening for me. I mean, I I probably have a little bit of a different perspective uh, than you guys in terms of like, because I wasn't very focused on physique as much, but it was very much like it was the taboo. Because if if you had, if I knew anybody that was like taking anabolic steroids, it was like, you know, a big cheat in yeah. our world, yeah. and so. Uh, you know, for me to then go from personal training and then in Gold's gym, especially I was in the locker room and I see guys like, you know, using and they're like doing their thing. And, and then I would continuously see that. And it was like, I'm like, where's all this crazy muscle? Like where, why don't you guys look like bodybuilders already? And mm -hmm. it was just like, it, it just didn't have that effect that I thought was like, that was all part of the package I thought promoted it. I mean, uh, we, the boys cut, uh, Josh cut up a clip from my series, um, where I talk about steroids and this is, I fell into this trap in my twenties, early twenties. Uh, I'd already been training for a while. I'd already been a trainer. I already thought. I kind of knew nutrition. I thought I kind of knew programming and uh, I've trained hard, trained seven days a week, double days, sometimes consistent and looked pretty average, looked good for the average person, but I definitely didn't look like cover of a magazine. And I was convinced that the only thing that separated from me and the cover of those magazines guys was they were on steroids and I wasn't. And so I began taking steroids and was so disappointed. So disappointed on the results that I saw. I did not get very good results at all. I remember feeling and seeing the strength difference. So I felt yeah. them. I definitely like, I remember feeling like so strong. But because I hadn't honed in diet and recovery and programming yet, I saw really minimal results. Most of it was water weight. Most of it went right away as soon as I came off the cycle. Yeah. And I really was like, and then, and then this is, how, faces. this is how ignorant and naive I was, oh, but I must not have had enough right? <laughs> or I didn't have the best ones, you know, mm -hmm. or maybe I need to try this one and try that one. And so I went down the whole gamut of all different types of steroids and stacks and had the anabolic Bible. And like, and then I went in this whole like pharmaceutical journey. Uh, it's got to be a combination mm -hmm. of steroids that I haven't figured out how to put together, not realizing like, no, I really didn't know what the hell I was doing nutritionally and programming just because I had my little trainer certification, had a little bit of experience. I really didn't mm -hmm. understand how to program properly. And it wasn't until by the time I'm in my late twenties, early thirties, that it all started to come full circle. Well, when you became a pro, when you were actually competing, uh, you know, getting a pro card as an IFBB physique competitor, those were, I mean, you, you're very open. You you would tell me what you were taking. It was they were the lowest doses you would take. You yeah. take you took in your basically your life of being on anabolics. I mean, before like, that like TRT dose. Besides yeah. being on TRT, uh, those were the lowest doses you were taking. That was what way less than what you took in your 20s and got way worse results. So I actually I've told stories about. I haven't talked much about the the male side. I've told you guys before on the podcast that I built this kind of like business unintentionally when I was competing. I wasn't trying to build an online business or coaching business. I didn't do it for that reason. Uh, yet I did, and what why I did was that gets around like in the it's a small community and so when you start seeing somebody come up in the in the you know MPC and then the IFBB and they make a pretty good run pretty fast like I did where I come out of nowhere and all of a sudden you know, I'm a pro word got around and I was very and everyone's very open in that community like everybody would share their what stacks and drugs and things they're doing and so like that and I was known as like the guy who was like you know who claimed because a lot of people didn't mm -hmm. believe how low of a dose I took. And I, and I would tell a lot of these guys, and I see some of these stacks for men's physique. I mean, you're talking about grams of steroids. 
some of these guys who couldn't even place were Whoa. taking. And I'm like, Dang. dude, the answer is not more of these drugs. Yeah. Like, we got to come way off all this stuff. It's actually only making it more difficult, believe it or not, because you're like a walking chemistry set mm -hmm. right now. And you're overtraining, under eating. You're doing so many things wrong. And the answer isn't another drug to stack on this. It was really c very common in the men's physique space. And so I started to collect all these clients of people that are really kind of fucked up their hormone levels mm -hmm. and were taking all these drugs and teaching them that, man, you do not need to take that much at all. In fact, I've shared openly that I went, so my very first show, I was taking the TRT dose. I got fourth place. Now I got fourth place because I posed like shit. It was uh, you look at the video. So you were just on your TRT. Yeah, it was TRT. Like when two, I did. Was it what 150, yeah. 200 milligrams yeah, a week? Yeah. At yeah. that time, I, so this is when I first was getting on TRT. It was about 150 right now. A week. Uh, one, yeah, 150. Because when I was still working with that one company, I hadn't gone up to 200. 200 is where I keep myself now. But I was at 150 mm -hmm. then, and so uh, I bumped my dose. I bumped my dose to like three, four hundred. Uh, it, after that show, thinking uh, just again, yeah. should have learned my lesson in my twenties. I should know better, right? Still <laughs> did it again. Like, oh, maybe I need to be a little more jacked. Better. Then I come to Contra Costa. I get sixth place, but was pissed because I I packed on like an extra fifteen muscle pounds of muscle. Mm -hmm. Came to the judges afterwards and said, "Hey, what's 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 up? What's on?" They're like, "Sir," they go, "You're too big for men's physique." This now, granted, this is back when I was doing it because now the guys now look, the guys are all here, now the guys yeah. look like that. But when I was in it, yeah. still it, they still were trying to keep it kind of like a you know model yeah. men's health look and I got too jacked for that and I went oh shit so that was the last time that I bumped my dose up then I came back down to a 200 and I kind of stayed at 200 You know where I'll, I'll tell you the big difference is with hormones is if you are deficient if you're deficient if your testosterone is really low uh if your thyroid is really low then using hormones can be a game changer because you're going from deficient to you know, high normal. That's a game changer. Yeah. Like if you're a man and you're walking around, uh, you know, with testosterone levels that are almost non-existent and then you get on TRT. So now you're at the high normal range that does make a big difference. I want to be very clear. It's like taking uh, a nutrient. It's like taking vitamin C. You don't notice it much, but if you're lacking vitamin C, you notice big time. Yeah. That's where you see the big differences. Um, now anabolics do have, uh, definitely have effects on performance, but people would be shocked to, to, to realize how little the effects uh, are to the drugs and how much more go to the genetics and then the training and the diet. And the drugs do play a role, but if you took all the drugs out of the game, the, the best people would still be the best people. And um, that's why it's a, it's a silly game of like, well, can you tell? You know, oftentimes, sometimes you can. I mean, of course, if, like I said, you see a pro bodybuilder, like, okay, well, that's obvious. Yeah. But you walk in your gym and you try to point out who's on gear, who's not on gear, guaranteed, number one, you're missing five people that are on that don't look like it. And yeah. I guarantee you're going to be off on 50% of the people that you think I mean, I on. think that the Ronnie Coleman example is such a good example of how you can't tell. I mean, yeah. if you, in the past, if you would ask me, I would have said, oh, yeah, there's definitely some clear signs, but... I mean, he clearly looks like he's on steroids. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. he clearly looks, un I mean, he's granular. He's freaking shredded to the bone. He's got crazy muscle mass yeah. and density. All the signs say, oh, he's probably on it, but he's not. And I've ran into enough situations like that where I was wrong. And I've seen enough people taking grams of it and they look like shit that it's like, yeah. and, and all of it comes back down to this for the listener who's like so interested in this topic is that like, you shouldn't be comparing yourself to others anyways. No matter what, steroids, no steroids. Like, get away from looking at the influencer and going, well, he, I mean, even I just posted my, and we knew this was going to happen, right? So funny, too. Like, we were, I, I couldn't have documented this process any more <laughs> than I did. I mean, I've fucking showed every meal. Yeah. I've documumented every workout. I've been Body on, fat test. Yeah, yeah. I, did every, I did everything. Told everybody to what was going to happen. I said, you're going to see me put on a bunch of muscle in a short period of time because I had 50 pounds of muscle. And if a guy like you brought it to Colorado experiment, that's the science that supports how that muscle memory works. Knowing all that, communicating all that, we still got all the freaking, yeah. this is fake. This is not real. Oh, he's taking hell on steroids. It's like, okay. It's it, the point of this uh, is that it was to show people like the power of muscle memory and how cool it is that. Once you have built a good base like that, uh, it doesn't take as much as you think. Uh, and that's all that's changed. I, I've been on the same TRT dose for uh, oh, 13 years now, uh, relatively consistently. I had that one hiatus that I tried to go back and get off completely and 
and didn't have any success for a couple of years there and then went back back to my my TRT dose that's but I, that's not I didn't change any of that I, all I changed was diet and exercise uh, effort towards hitting protein intake. I was I was consistent with the EAAs and creatine, uh, but other than that, that's really all it is. It really has more to do with the training, diet, exercise, and muscle memory than it has to do with anything well, else. Well, muscle memory is one of the most powerful uh, muscle building effects you'll find anywhere. End of story. And by the way, listen: the average person who has ever broken a limb has experienced the power of this. If you've ever had a limb in a cast and you yep. take the cast off and you look at your arm and it's like skin and bone, it's you're like, wild. oh my God. And then you don't even work out. You just go about your day and then within a couple of weeks, it looks like it's back to normal. What grew the muscle back? Muscle memory. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. That's yeah. an epigenetic phenomenon. Um, so you know, have you again, ever had that? Have you ever had a, yeah. a arm and a cast? I had my, my leg in a cast. Oh, your leg in a cast. Yeah. yeah. And when they took it off, it was like my my knee my knee joint was bigger than my fem the femur was all skinny. Yeah. But it came back. Dude, so I fast. broke my right arm twice in the same year. And I was like having a panic attack because of how it just shrunk, and yeah. then and then trying to get back into playing sports because I was just a, a sports fiend, you know. I played everything, and I was like the starting pitcher, and I was all this stuff, yeah. and you know. And then I was like trying to get back in, and then broke it again, and then I'm like, oh my god, I wonder if it gets just like down to the bone. <laughs> like, what am I going to have left? You know, I was just oh so paranoid, but it all came back. Fast. Pat, like so fast yeah. it's crazy that's that's yeah. muscle that's what adam's working with so people are like how do you gain 18 pounds of lean body mass in in 30 days well you're, yeah. you're 50 pounds behind i mean that's the, the the testament is more about how much i lost i mean it's actually that's it's, it it's taking a long time to lose 50 pounds 50. of muscle <laughs> yeah. you got 18 that doesn't sound crazy to me at all yeah yeah it, it took a long time like you have to understand that we're at one we're comparing to peak version of me right so 30 years old uh 32 is probably about where i was at peak that was the most lean body mass yeah that was the that's what but I, you know what's funny? Gaining back the 18 pounds, you're you're still within where you walked around for most of your adult life. Forget yeah. the c competing. Yeah. You know, 50 pounds of more lean body mass, that was a pro. But yeah. even before that, 18 pounds puts you within- That's why- That's the, where you've lived Okay, so when, when the guys were titling it, I don't know if you guys didn't even notice that I did this. Uh, the boys were asking me, like, what do you want to title it? Like, because we were trying to make like a big title for the very, the very, very first one we did. And it was like, watch a bodybuilder- Gain back 25 pounds. The yeah. reason why I said 25 pounds was for you that. That would be the easiest. I yeah. figured I knew I could, I could, I'll slingshot to 25 pretty quick. After that, I assume it's going to be a grind. Mm -hmm. I don't even, and I don't even know if I will pursue 50, all 50 back. I'm not yeah. trying to be the bodybuilder version of yeah. me, but I definitely know that I kept, I've kept myself around this size, give or take. Most of your adult life. Most of my adult life. Yeah. So my body wa wants to be this yeah, size. There, if yeah. I just feed it like it's supposed to, stimulate it a little bit, it'll go right back to here. It, it, it'll be a slow grind and climb if I was trying to go all the way back to 50. So that's why I didn't want to put like watch a bodybuilder or watch an ex-bodybuilder build his 50 back because I don't even want to go all the way back Have there. you seen, speaking of Ronnie Coleman, he had severe uh, nerve damage <coughs> in his spine. He, yeah. he can't walk properly. Crazy energy, yeah. in injuries. Have you seen him working out? And he works out with lightweight, still lifts weights. He's more jacked than I'll ever be still. And it's and he can't yeah. even do much because of the nerve damage, because yeah. of that muscle memory. Yeah. He had so much what muscle in the built. past. Yeah. yeah. Well, I remember I remember when we met Ben Pakolsky. That was really enlightening for me too. Yeah. Um and I've and I've experienced it now a little myself. Obviously not to their level, right? Those guys had hundreds of pounds of more muscle. I had fifty. Um yeah. so it's pretty wild, which is too like, oh man, I guess I guess the message that I want to communicate so much or I feel so passionate about. Cause I didn't, I don't think I understood this in my twenties. It's just like, man, it's, it's like trying to teach a kid. It's like the same lesson. I'm, I'm like, I'm so excited to teach my son mm -hmm. about smart investing with money. Cause I didn't get taught about money. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, if you start it early and you don't have to, you don't have to create, you don't need to save millions of dollars. You just a little bit, you put away mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you just keep, and you do that consistently, son. Where you're going to be financially when you're 30, 40, 50 is going to be unbelievable. Think, yeah. The same thing goes with weight training. Like I want to teach him the same yeah. thing. It's the like, thing you always do. Think yes. of it this way. So there's an ep there's epigenetic changes that happen to muscle when you initially build it. And so to g the best analogy I can give is you're going to build a new building. And so in order to build the building, you need the materials. Uh, so that represents the food. 
but you also need the the machines that build the building. So you need the backhoe and the crane and the shovels and the hammers. and So that process takes time to get all the machinery, to get all that stuff ready to go, and then the workers that operate the machinery. So you build the building. Now something happens and the, the building gets torn down. That's you losing the muscle. You don't lose the machinery or the workers. They stay they stay there the whole yeah, time. Or the blueprint. Next time you're ready to build that building back up, boom, twice as fast because yeah. everything's ready. We've already built it. We have the blueprints. We got the machinery. We got the workers. All we need are the nutrients. And, and the, I, yeah. you got to highlight uh, what you just said, Justin, because I actually think the blueprints really matter a lot too. Yeah, like I, time. I know exactly what to do. It goes right yeah. into place. I, yeah, the more you've done this, not only do you get the benefits of the muscle memory thing, you also know exactly. Like yeah. this is the part that I always try and communicate to Katrina when she's like, "It's so not fair." It's like, honey, you have to understand that I've been doing this for 25 years. Yeah. So, and let me tell you, a lot of the wrong way for a long time. Yeah. And I've now, I have honed in on the blueprint. I know exactly what dials to turn for me, which has made me a pretty good coach for other people too, mm -hmm. but boy, do I really know myself. I know myself yeah, better than sequence. anybody. This goes before this, before this, before this, before yeah. this, and it all works out so much more You've done it before. Yeah. You've done it uh, before. So true. You guys ready so. for the uh, our uh, photo shoot later? <laughs> yeah, What's our the... favorite thing to Jeez, do. Man. Has it really been a year? Dude. Is it been a, or is it quarter? Quarterly. Do we do this quarterly or annually? I think. Will this one go better for me? Is the question. Justin's that's, always. That's just yeah. the, the real question. No. So we. we How we, often do we do this? I don't know. It seems like quarterly. We do photo shoots and stuff for some of our sponsors. Uh, this one's going to be Viore, which we love. We love the brand. We love. I the mean, stuff. we're all wearing oh, their clothes. Yeah. Man. I've got the just, are you wearing? No, yeah. You got these the are Viore. Yeah. yeah. We're all yeah. in Viore right yeah, now. Yeah. They're great. So they'll come in and they'll film us in our stuff. Um, and then we've never done this before. Adam and I are going to go to a Viore store. Yeah. And get filmed in there. I don't know what we're supposed to do in their shop. <laughs> yeah, no what, are we, what are we doing? Hey, some we're here to shop. Stuff we're, doing some tic <laughs> we're doing some TikTok thing. Probably. No way, really? I don't know. I I, no my idea. favorite is watching you guys act. Uh, that's uh, why, yeah, it's, that's a good It's not time. acting, it's real. It's, no, it's, so, oh, it's, no, it's, it's very, it's it's, very it's, difficult for us to, to do the put on that. But you know what? Viore makes it easy because all we have to do is go put on the outfits. We already wear all the clothes. I mean, look at this. is Obviously, we didn't even have this planned. Uh, we're always in it. Uh, my Viore is custom, though. I customize mine. Mine are, these are You not, do, huh? You yeah, take them to Taylor? Yeah. So I take them and I get them. I get the, because these are the rip stop. And I get them. I get. I put. Have them put. You a get last them pegged. Yeah, I get them at pegged. The bottom. Yeah, that <laughs> yeah. sounds. So that sounds terrible. <laughs> that used to mean something else. Yeah, that's when you used to <laughs> fold your pants <laughs> at the bottom. Everybody. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah everybody yeah, relax. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, like these the are the ones. I think thing. ripstop is what you wear a lot, right? Don't you wear the ripstop? I wear those. Yeah, quite a bit. I mean, I think between those and the meta pants, because the meta pants are just like I can wear them pretty much to dinner and anything it's the, so much easier uh meta pant my my favorite going out look and i, I apologize to viore that i have to shout another brand out too in addition but it's like my my meta pants my black ones because they almost look dressy slack like when they're they're so comfortable yeah uh they look dressy slack. i wear that with the, the white t-shirt just like this yeah. and i wear that that pea coat from uh from state and liberty yeah that look is like so comfortable and it's so easy Very classy look yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it looks sharp and i can even dress it up more i throw a scarf yeah. over and like now i look super super fancy you put a scarf on yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you I like do. scarves yeah. i do you're yeah, like I'm the only guy i know i could pull that off <laughs> pull scarf, a scarf off scarf, yeah, really it's, it's not like i mean I, I take it a little bit back because when i was in the midwest that was definitely a thing we think you had to have a scarf you have thing. to i i refused obviously like you know when i got there i didn't have any down jacket or like i'm just sweatshirt on sweatshirt on sweatshirt i'm gonna be fine yeah and i wasn't fine i was freezing my ass off. cold yeah. well i went on the kick there was a kick there was a time when it's kind of came and went though and i wonder if it'll make its way back but what are the what's the what's the like Middle Eastern scarves called? They're like checkered pattern. I went oh, on yeah. that cravat. No, they're they're called something. Do you know what they're called? All the special forces guys wear. Those. Yeah, they, special forces guys oh, wears them all the time. Yeah. That was like a popular style for a while. I had a, like a whole drawer of like probably forty of those. Oh, yeah. I, I, wow. yeah, I wore them every day. That like the cowboy uh, bolo. Yeah, is that what Bro, that I is? used to wear that in the 80s, dude. Is did you? a little tassel yeah, thing? Dude. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Oh, yeah. wow. So, you didn't? You think no, it's Chuck I Norris? Did you wear them? <laughs> hey, dude. No, who is it? Steven Seagal wears them. Oh, Steven Seagal. Yeah, 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 was it yeah, Steven yeah, Seagal that wore that? Oh, my God. That was an 80s. a ponytail? That's such a... That was an 80s thing. I don't remember Instead of wearing a tie, you wear a... It's called a bolo, right? I think you're right. Yeah, it's a bolo. Yeah, because I just called it the cowboy tie. Yeah. Is that what they're called? No, that's that's, that's not it. That's no, like this, a headdress. This, 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 what the hell? No, it's that scarf. It is. Yeah, it is it like is yeah, that, that scarf. scarf right there. What yeah. are those called? Kefie, oh. I guess is how you pronounce. I don't know if it, that's how you pronounce it. Uh, Look up a bolo, Doug. Bolo tie. Bolo, the little strap one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anybody, who wears those? 
Cowboys. Oh, nobody. That was a thing. And then belt buckles, you know, for a minute had uh, their day yeah. in the sun. Belt. I remember I had a belt buckle this big, and I'm not even a cowboy, dude. Like, what the hell? No, was it was. Doing? It became like a. Uh, it became like a. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, Fad? It's, yeah, well, yeah. It's like it became a style fashionable. even outside of that. Like you, there when we were. Is this in, when you tuck in just the front yes, t-shirt? Yes, yeah. yes, oh yes, God. yes. I did yes. that for a minute. That did a, you ever? Did you have? I know you did. I'm sure you had jeans with the the. All the fancy embroidery yeah, in the back. Of course, uh, <laughs> rhinest- rhinestones on my fucking jeans. No, you did. Yeah. No, you did it. Did you really? Yeah, I had white, like white stitching. I had some really I mean, over the top. Designers. I wore the Zubas, Pat. You know those those or Zubaz. It's the uh, uh, oh, those, MC Hammer. Those, hey, look, those hey, are meathead pants. Oh, I definitely did that. I had those. Those are meathead pants. I look That's back true. at probably probably one of the worst periods of my life like dress wise is because it was not only was it combined with that style style you said those and those jeans were like four or five hundred dollars yeah. back then was like it's like me paying yeah, thousand like dollars for jeans it's like a thousand dollars for jeans which that was and i had no business <laughs> yeah. at that time in my life like i was i was making okay money not but like not to buy no thousand yeah, I, yeah i wouldn't even do that now you know what i'm <laughs> saying like nah it's too much for jeans you know what i'm saying especially ones that are like loud like that that are gonna go out of style like no way so and that with Ed Hardy t shirts that oh, cost Ed, Ed Hardy, Hardy and Smet shirts that cost me like two fifty, three hundred bucks. T-shirt. Oh, yeah, t-shirt. And oh, all that that was huge for a minute. It was cool for you know, I tell like uh the kids that make fun of that because obviously if you are under the age of twenty five, you yeah. tease and joke about Ed Hardy, but there was a point when Ed Hardy was cool. Yeah. Because the origin of it was a guy in LA was a tattoo artist. Yeah. It was tattoos. It was tattoos yeah, was that were put designs. on a shirt and it was very uh, niche, hard to and get. And they started selling it like they just and they flooded were, the market, right? Yes. And then TJ Maxx bought them out and then it flooded the market that everybody could then afford. It's lame because everybody can then er- Exactly. Yeah. Then, and so the, so the generation remembers that. Same thing for Affliction. Both Affliction and Ed Hardy, they were cool for a minute. Okay, so but I remember how, how much that sucked because I had a closet of like you know it took tap me out. Wrong way. Yeah. Never cool. <laughs> ne- ne- <laughs> never cool is right. I wore tap out never for a second. Cool. No. I was that guy. No, when you, first, you did it. Listen, you? When you, oh. this is how you know when somebody wears stuff like I that. I feel like Justin they just would, started jujitsu. I feel like Justin would have fought you in I high school. I would have had words. <laughs> I would at least friends. had words, dude. Would've, he would have fought everybody. <laughs> no, that's no. I, I, Justin would have totally throw stuff at you. In Not class. now. Everybody knows yeah. jujitsu and shit. You know, that's that's what when you first start jujitsu you. This is how you know when people wear shirts that say jujitsu or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, like it's oh, like the CrossFit. Just it's like the CrossFit and vegan jokes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? How do you know someone's into that? They, they, they tell, tell you. you? Yeah. <laughs> like they wear they wear their affliction. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'm going to bring up a study on sleep real quick. Did you guys? Okay, so we know that temperature in the room affects sleep, but I actually have a study that shows how much. Okay. It's a ten percent decrease in sleep efficiency. So ten percent. Wow. That's pretty. And they did the, the comparison was between a room that was sixty eight degrees or one that was eighty degrees. So I so ten percent difference in sleep just for the temperature of the room. <laughs> Nothing else. So I don't know if Eight Sleep listens to our commercials that we do for them, but if they do, this is to you guys. I want somebody to do a, a test, and I tell you this would sell like crazy. You remember when uh, our other partner PRX did the the gym calculator thing? Where they're like, you know, build your own gym. Then you oh, how much in, it would cost? Yeah, how oh. much it would basically cost to like, and then it's like, oh my God, no brainer. Like, that's my gym membership for the next three years. And they really did, smart. When for, they did that. Brilliant. I want eight sleep to do the same thing with temperature in your house running your Air electricity. Yeah. Yes, because one of the biggest things that I've been able to do is to take my air conditioning that I used to run at 66 degrees through the night, every night, I can let it be at 72, 73 degrees. I technically could probably push higher, but I don't need to. It stays, gets down to 72, 73 all day. So my AC does not run at night like it used to, mm. and I sleep just as good because the bed is so cool. Yeah. If the bed isn't like that, I you know from all the hotels that we've been to, I have to have it buried to the ground. Yeah. So, and I ha- you have to think the difference of the house running six degrees warmer and not running the AC. How long does it take to pay off to st- pay off what it costs for that? To me, that would be the yeah. ultimate selling point because I know the average person goes like, "Oh man, I really want one." They're like, "Oh, that's kind of expensive," but if you did the math on. Well, if you could run your house yeah. at four degrees less for X amount of months, how many months before yeah. it pays itself off? Like yeah. that's a, yeah. it's a wrap. It'd be interesting to see, yeah. right? Uh, but it also it also you know monitors your sleep. Oh, it does uh, so much, more. and then it adjusts the temperature to make it perfect. Because these studies are general. Yeah, but there's a there's well, a variance okay, between people. So, okay, so in this study, was it just with men or women too? Is that? And I'm asking because that's a good question. My wife likes is, it probably different. Yeah, like, it, and I've been trying to sell her on that 
No, I didn't have the ten percent, you know, data, but I was like, it's just better if if it's cooler. Like everybody's gonna get into deeper sleep. Like we're gonna benefit from this. She's like, I'm first my ass off. Is it? Is, is she? So yeah, you know, it's funny. It I, used to be a fight at our house. That's a, it literally that's it's I think eight sleep has saved our marriage. Really? A hundred percent. That was one selling of the, point. One of Don't the get one of the biggest fights is temperature at our house. Yeah. Because her and I run so different in, in that way. I mean I'm, I'm so I'm so finicky. The minute I walk in the door, it just happened yesterday. Yeah. I walked in the door and I go, You didn't turn on the AC on today? And she's like, Ah. Oh. And I walk over and it's 74 and it's got to be below 72 or else I'll feel it instantly. Like, I just know. Like, that's, I feel like, and I don't know if it's like an old dad thing or something. Like, once you get to a certain age, oh, yeah. like. A, oh, you feel like the slightest a degree. change. Yeah. I can tell a degree difference. If she got cold and she went over and she like tried to sneak a degree up, I'll be sitting there and I'll be like, did you touch the AC? Yeah. yeah. Was, ah. See, my house was the opposite. When I was a kid, we weren't allowed to turn, turn anything on. Oh, yeah. you're, oh, you're cold? Mm -hmm. Put like, on a jacket. Oh, yeah. I'm in the house. You get beat. I'm in the house, dad. <laughs> yeah. Wear a jacket yeah, in the house. Yeah. You know? I'm hot. Take off your shirt. <laughs> yeah. Okay, dude. Well, dude, I, I would I would speculate that if if I could get her to like her side to be warmer, but then towards the middle of the night, like it cools it down. She wouldn't even really notice. She'd have way better, better sleep. sleep. I still think it applies. I just yeah. think it's that initial shock. You should you should do that though. I'm, I'm going because you could control it. I control Katrina's side. I completely control her. I didn't her. even thought to do that. Yeah, I, she doesn't know it. She, and, and you could totally do it slowly so she wouldn't be the wiser. Yeah. So you could set it to where it goes like, okay, minus one at midnight, minus two. And then don't two. say anything. Wait yeah, they, yeah don't like, say anything. Yeah. Like, hey, how's the sleep been going? Oh, my God, so oh, good. Yeah. You could even so much reverse it back out to where it warms back up in the morning so she has she's not the wiser. Just, it wakes yeah, you no up. Clue. Yeah. It wakes you up nicely, too, when it does that. And then you let her know, yeah. by the way, the reason yeah. why you've been getting such good sleep this week, I've been adjusting your temperature yeah, in the bed. I actually <laughs> like the cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway. Hey, sorry to interrupt you. Look, are you lifting weights, eating a ton of food, and struggling. You're not packing on any muscle. You're not building any muscle at all. You're not getting stronger. Well, check it out. We have a hard gainer guide. This can be your ultimate resource to turn that around. Pack on some muscle mass with our hard gainer guide. It's totally free. You can get it by downloading it, clicking on the link in the description below. So we were talking earlier about your workouts and stuff. Are you, I noticed something about an exercise we program uh, in most of our programs. And yesterday I was doing it here in the gym, and Kyle even commented, he said, I don't see a lot of people doing those, and I still don't, and I still think people are missing out on pullovers, good old dumbbell pullovers. Yeah, you don't really see those a lot. It's such a great exercise. I don't, I, I, yeah, it's like deadlifts came back, squats came back. I know people who are young right now are like, those never left. They did. There was a period there where people didn't want to do those. Dumbbell pullovers used to be a staple muscle-building exercise for a long time, fell out of favor, and I'm wondering if it's people don't know how to do them right or they don't know how to program them. Yeah. But it's like, there's very few exercises that move and, and strengthen that plane of motion. And it's yeah. so good for you shoulder mobility. And uh, tricep Develops the lats really well. You know it's, what's funny is actually I'm so glad you're bringing about this. Today I have to shoot one of my videos. I'm on upper body. I haven't done pullovers yet in this whole series. They feel good, too. And you add in the fact, too, that right now I'm still working on my shoulder mobility and my scapular yeah. articulation. Just go light, work on the range of motion. Yeah, yeah. I'm totally doing that. Do today. you guys know back in the day, like early days of uh, bodybuilding, this is like the 19, I want to say 40s, uh, the pullover was one of the exercises they would use as a test of strength. So there was like the overhead press, oh, wow. later on the bench press, uh, the deadlift always, right? The Olympic lifts were always there. But was the it pullover, pullover Monday? Pull <laughs> no. Is that the staple back then? No, no. But they would, they would, they would compete and talk about how much they could do. I wonder why it's mm. not. And they made a pullover bench back in the day. There used to be what was called a pullover bench, specifically for. I don't know because it's really it's not that huh. difficult to get into. It's, it's not a that, great. It's not that great difficult exercise. to teach in the form and technique. It's pretty easy. Actually, they, you know how they used to sell it yeah. in the seventies, sixties, uh, and seventies. They sold it as a rib expansion exercise. What a weird way to sell that. You know yeah. why? Because they this was a thing. It's just weird. If I brought this up now, nobody would care. But back then, apparently, they would say, do this exercise, and it gives you a bigger rib cage. Because I guess people wanted a bigger, maybe to stick their chest out. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> and so they said that the dumbbell pullover, because it stretches the rib cage. It doesn't grow your rib cage, everybody. No. But that's the way they sold it. <laughs> that's, that's that's the way that's that they really sold That's really how they sold it? That's, yes, dude. That's fun. Maybe that's why it has no fear. Maybe because they sold it so terribly. Everybody, yeah, everybody's like, I don't need to grow my rib they cage. They used to do with barbells. They used yeah. to do a barbell pullover. And there were some strength athletes in the 40s that would do with 300 plus pounds. Wow. 
doing it. I've seen guys do a 225. I've on never seen anybody go that heavy with I've it. I've never really done it with a barbell too often. So yeah, I, I like dumbbells too. I've done it with a barbell like that before. It's actually not bad. Well, like an easy curl bar? I, or like yeah, easy no, curl straight, bar, straight bar. Straight yeah, straight bar off the bench oh, press. Really? So unhook it off the bench press and then roll back over this way. Oh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, I've done it like that before. I, but you know what? The, the the dumbbell works just fine. I like the and dumbbell. You can get, you can get it, you can get heavy enough dumbbells to really work it just fine. I don't. You don't need to put any more weight on it than, than it's that. It's one of the key exercises that I used to develop my back and improve my shoulder mobility. Yeah, I'm a little disappointed mm -hmm. in myself that I didn't program that in already. That's definitely going in there now. I don't know why. You're I'll I'm going to do it today. You could have gained more muscle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that it, it is 18 really pounds could have been 20 pounds yeah, had I done yeah. that. Like No, I, and and the fact that it, it improves like shoulder mobility to do that, it's I should be doing exercises. Speaking of exercises, do yeah. you know what is becoming uh, somewhat popular in the bodybuilding space? I saw C-Bum doing these. Half foam roller flies. Do you remember talking about those, bro? That's my move. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember I, those? I, in, like, I, that's my forever. Move. I've been teaching that move forever. Yeah. I love. You know what? I think I saw him. Somebody else. I the think, range of motion is just. It's incredible. You know what he does with it? He does cable flies, and he puts. I it saw on the bench that. Behind. I yeah. saw. I did see it. He was being. Was it Hani? Yes. Some, yeah, Hani was teaching him that. I have always taught that on the floor. On the yeah. floor is floor so dumbbells. great for teaching a clients to because what it does is to it, bring their shoulder blades. That's back. right. Your shoulder blades drop to the side like that, so it forces you to engage the chest. It was such a great. It's work. actually a great. Actually, feels good for most people if you get a half foam roller laid on the floor, lay on it, put well, your you head. True range of motion that way you, you put your head on the top of it you don't want your head to hang off and then you run right, it down your, your spine button. drop your hips and just relax and let your arms open up most people get a lot of pain relief yeah. just from it's laying so there. expansive yeah because yeah. it just feels you don't, you so, don't get yeah. that very often you if know. if anybody who's been listening or following me from the very beginning like this was something i did way early on i actually just, I had videos of me uh yeah. of doing these exercises i love and i think part of it too sal is that the foam roll the the standard foam roll is the perfect size for to support your head to your tailbone to your tailbone yeah it's like you lay, you fit perfectly on it mm. you, it's comfortable like you said like i used to love just laying there that's it and like i open up my chest yep. and just like stretch everything yep. and then it's a great way to get in there and fly great what a great movement what i've never done though is i when i did see uh, on the cable fly yeah I've actually never thought to do it there. I always did it on the floor. I feel like it would give you a really good stretch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll try. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll have to do that the next time. I'm, I don't know if I'm going yeah. to be a machine. You know, I've been meaning to ask you this. I just read a study on uh, exercise and its neuro effects. And what they found in this study was that the amount of uh, the, the creative ideas and uh, periods of motivation that people got went up as people exercised and the effect lasted like weeks. So like people working out a week or two later, they were able to connect it with neural pathways that lead to more creative ideas. So the reason why I'm asking this is because you stopped working out for a while. Yeah. You're working. Are you fine? Because that's where I get all my ideas. When I'm writing for the show and stuff, it's always yeah. during my well, work. You're more inspired these days. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that there's a no brainer uh, that to me, I don't know if I would connect to creativity as much as I would create to productivity. So when well, I, I mean, being productive is, is a form of creativity. Sure. So that's why yeah. I like, I, like the, that if you were to ask me how I would describe it, that's how I would describe it. Yeah. I don't consider myself a very creative person. Um, I think though my productivity is like significant. One of the videos I recorded, um, I think Dylan caught this on camera. I was sharing with him that, you know, it's so funny, no matter how many times I've done this, and I fall off, I come back in, in the rhythm. When I do, the thing, I'm going through my head going like, this is a horrible time to do this. I've got all kinds of personal stuff going on. i got business stuff going on. We're in the middle of this thing. We're in the middle of that thing. i got this injury. I always have all these things uh, that I'm going, this is not the time for me to be training like crazy and consistently. What always happens is once I get going and I break through that first week or two and I got some momentum, it's almost like I get two to four more hours a day in the day. Mm -hmm. Like, like I get more. Like it, now I'm only I'm only spending an hour, but it almost feels like I get two to four hours in return of productivity. Yeah. I'm just I get more stuff done at the house. I get more stuff done at work. I'm just a better version, a sharper version of me when I'm training. I just it's and it's silly and funny that I still am like everybody else where I have or like the normal person where I have that conversation of like oh I'm too busy. Proper exercise does take well exercise in general takes energy, but when it's applied properly it produces more energy than it takes uh it's it's a strange it's a good way to say it it's a strange form of physics but you know if your energy levels are at a 10 and exercising costs you three of those uh, of the 10 so you're taking three away 
but you do it properly, you're not left with seven, you're left with 15 because it actually adds more energy in your capacity. Now, if you overdo it, that's when it becomes it a problem. So draining. Yeah, then then now you're losing energy. But but I mean, every person I've ever trained, ever, found themselves to be more productive. Actually, there's, stu there's studies on this. They've done studies yeah. on this where um, this is how we used to sell corporate memberships back in the day. We would bring the data and we'd show them your employees, if they devote two hours a week of exercise uh, to exercise, yeah. they their productivity goes up by 30% or whatever. And then you would do the math and show them how paying for a corporate membership actually saves them money uh, as a result. So the data I hate on that sitting down. Huh? I hate, so I hate sitting down. Yeah. yeah. It really is like the antithesis of productivity. Like it's just, it, it you just feel that, um, that shift, uh, yep. it, just like you'd feel if you went to go exercise and you get that lift, like this is like a suck. Yeah. You know, you, to add to that, Sal, and, and I think this is an area where, I mean, I still, again, I just did this the other day, overreached is the mistake I made in the past more than I still make it, but the mistake I made it when I was younger was thinking that the workout, I had to crush it. And, and that sometimes can feel draining and feel like, oh, how do I do this every single day? Going to the gym and having a minimalist attitude of, you know, and it just highlights what you talked about the other day about mm -hmm. like how how 85% of the positive results you get is just by getting 8,000 steps in a day. Like that's 85, you're 85% of the way already mm -hmm. of being a healthy person just by taking the steps. Yes. Like, so that really highlight, and then we know the benefits of strength training. It's like you really don't need to do that much in no. there to get reap all these great Here, benefits we're talking about. Here's what it is. We tend to think, people tend to think that we're operating in this baseline, uh, baseline of health, and that when we exercise and, and change our diet, we're going to improve above the baseline. But here's the truth. We're far below what our baseline is supposed to be because our lifestyles are so unhealthy. Because the food that we eat is not good for us and we tend to overeat and it was engineered to make us overeat and because we're so inactive, we're so inactive, it's not even funny. The average person takes a few thousand steps a day if you're, if, if you're lucky. Most people have a desk job these days and most of us spend our leisurely time sitting down. So we're not at baseline. We're so below baseline that a little bit of exercise brings us up to where we're supposed to be and that feels profound. Mm -hmm. It feels profound. Like, oh my God, I feel great. You're supposed to feel that way uh, but it's not even taking you above and beyond that's when you start to do more and you get more but really like for most people eight thousand steps a day one day a week of some strength training for 45 minutes not eating heavily processed foods okay nothing else i'm not saying to do anything else i'm not saying to track make sure you do this make sure you do that here's your you know the perfect workout workout every day just just do that right there what you'll see are these profound health benefits because it's taking you to where you're supposed to be because we're so unhealthy that's, 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 you guys think that, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine because we obviously were born into it already uh, being adopted by society, but you know, just a hundred years ago, um, people would scoff at, at going to a gym to work out because your daily life was so physical and hard and you yeah. move so much. It's like, why would you go to a gym and Here's go your do more hard stuff? Totally. Here's your yeah. evidence. If you go back, uh, you know, decades back, 50 years, 60 years ago, seven years ago, it, back injury, back pain, excuse me, back pain, knee pain, shoulder pain, neck pain was due to overuse. It was due to overwork. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mr. Johnson's coming in. He's got back pain. How come? Well, he's, he's digging ditches all day long. Today, the vast majority of the reason why people have back pain, knee pain, shoulder pain, Center, neck pain yeah, is because they don't move. Yeah. It's the, it's totally different. So wild, right? So what I was getting at with that is, okay. That's what's happened in the last hundred years. Now we have seen just in the last couple decades, the acceleration of technology yeah. and everything. And we're even more like, so if gyms became a thing and became invented in the last hundred years as like a, 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 a adopted thing for society, because, Hey, we mm. need to, we're really not moving like we did back in the thirties mm. and the forties. What's the next form going to yes, be? Yes. What is the next thing or what does it look like 50 years from now? Because we're, I feel like we're right Simulated in the middle nature. Of, of us, like people waking up like, oh shit, yeah. like we're getting really bad. Like I'll make some predictions. Okay. Let's hear Let's. I here. think because in fact, I was just reading more about that. What's that peptide? I looked, I, I talked about it last time. Uh, it was S L U P. I'm going to look it up right now. S L U P exercise type uh, effects. Yeah, it's, to, yeah. It's, I, I'm gonna it's look used. it up. I was just talking to um, Jay Campbell. In fact, he's you know Mr. <laughs> Mr. Peptide. That guy's you know he's, he knows everything about this. S L U he's Peptide fan. It's S L U P P three three two. It's this long weird uh, uh, name, but it's a peptide that they 
showed in mice that they give the mice the peptide and it basically tells the body that it worked out. Yeah. So the mice improved their fitness, their stamina, built muscle, burned body fat, did nothing extra. Okay, so here's where I'm going with that. I feel like in the future, we're going to figure out how to create peptides uh, and, and, and drugs that trick the body into exercise adaptations, but we're still not going to get the same effect because some of the value of movement Is isn't just in the adaptation of the movement. Yeah. It's actually that we're doing something. For we're sure. actually you, doing something. You get the effect of what they're testing for, but like it, it's not going to account for all the downstream th you know, effects and, and the behaviors that yes. uh, result of that. And yeah, it's, we, it, it's all integrated. That, and that's the thing. I think we always come back to that. Even in our space, it's like, we always try to segment these different systems and we try to hone in on like the dysfunction. And it's like, we always have to look at it from a holistic perspective yep. and see how all the systems are interacting with each other. Well, what's happened to a lot of this is we have these desires that we've placated uh, with entertainment um, and those desires are there because they drove us to do things that were meaningful. So an example, um, the desire to uh, discover and accomplish, to conquer, to be challenged and to overcome, right? That's a, that's a natural human desire and oftentimes you get placated with like video games. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you get all this, especially with young men, right? This is, this is, I'll make this argument. The data I think supports this, that young men in particular, have this this need to like build and conquer whatever. And so now you got those young men who this why did this desire exist in the first place? Because it got us to do things. And then we yeah. felt accomplished and we did things and they were hard. Well that's but now we're doing it with video games. I mean it and everybody speculated this in like sci-fi movies and um, ways of training like in space and all this kind of stuff. But like in terms of where we're at with like VR, like it, nobody's talking about it right now, but it's still really popular and it's like growing Yeah. to the point where too, I've seen like these Omni treadmills and things that they're developing. So when they have any kind of movement in the game, they can actually walk there. They can do inclines and they can do all these things. And it's like portable. Like it, they've built it now where you can actually put one like in your house. So, you know, who knows down the road, like, cause it's, I mean, I, I find it interesting that even some, like I still have one of those and I don't really use it. Uh, but my kids got back into it. I, oh, they did. They got back into it and, and, and their friends are into it and they're oh, all interacting yeah. with it. So it's, I don't know. Like, I think it might be one of those almost like, you know, like, yeah, it kind of came early, uh, still needs yeah. some, some tweaking, but I think they're really making advancements with it again. You know, oh, interesting. Cause there, I, we were having some discussion about that with friends of mine and stuff like that. And we're just talking about, uh, you know, is the, is the Oculus thing dead already? Is it like the VR thing was like kind of cool when it was new and then everybody's cause that's how I feel. It's already become, it's already become like a thing of the past. Like, yeah. Oh, it's neat. It's kind of novel. Like, mm. but then it's just like, you know, do I really want to put this big old dumb thing on my face and am I going to do this again? It's like, <laughs> it is dorky looking. It is. Sure. It's over. And it's, and, and I, and I don't, I don't see that being practical where people are going to do that. I, I think the argument was always like AR would, would, yeah. would, would surpass it. Like that seems more the glasses that you have and I have now, I oh, feel yeah. the evolution of that seems more realistic. Like I do think that yeah. that technology of wearing that and then it being able to pick up, recognize faces, like all of a sudden I, I can look at Sal if I never knew who he was. All of a sudden it pops up all his social media links and tells me who he is, his age. Like that's kind of cool, right? Yeah. That we have that technology, right? That's, it's that's like minority report. It's yeah, yeah. There. So I could see, or you go somewhere, you're looking at apparel, clothes, and all of a sudden the price comes up and all that. Like I, I could see having AR stuff kind of cool yeah. uh, and, and more realistic. And I think I'm not anti-technology. I think that, that stuff is cool, but I do find it well, fascinating. Like physically, I think. I do, I do find it fascinating that we try to, it's like we're looking at the real world, real experiences, and then we're trying to recreate it. And uh -huh. with our arrogance, we're like, we'll make it better. Yeah. But, but we don't fully even understand the value of reality. We don't even fully understand what this experience is, and yet we're going to try to recreate it. The, the analogy I would, I, would, I would give is like, you bake a cake with your kids. You make the cake together. You bake it. You you, you know you put it in the oven. It comes out. Now you have a cake. And then we're like, oh, let's let's uh, mimic that. We'll just give you the cake. That's not the same experience at all. There's there's a lot of stuff that went into that with the connection, all that stuff. So I think we're trying to do that with so many different things. Uh, and I think we're going to continue to fall short. You know, who is it? Arthur Brooks talked about uh, FaceTime when you're FaceTiming and connecting with someone. You get the uh, dopamine but you lack the oxytocin. 
Yeah. yeah. Because you're not in person. And that's just one thing we can but imagine. But isn't, so can now to argue that though, just to play devil's advocate, isn't that a, a step better though than just talking on the phone? Sure. Because visually seeing you actually stimulates sure. and gives you a better response. I think there's value in these things, but uh, when we're, when we try to replace the everything from the real world, or try to replace workouts with things that trick your body into working out. Yeah, and you know that like stuff like that. Yeah. We don't even fully understand. I, I always like to like when when we have conversations like this. I like to speculate on what like makes a comeback because of that. Yeah. Like, what are the things that... I think what you said about the plugged, unplugged, you said that forever. I think yeah. that's gonna. I think that's legit. Yeah. I, I think, think there's going to be a whole group of people that are like... a subset of just like... Reject it all. Especially, yeah, well, just the, the trajectory of the whole thing. Like, I think people are really feeling the negative aspect of it. And so there's... I, I think in the, in the near future, a lot of people are going to be done with social media. I, I, I think so, too. I Like, you know how every generation of kid is like... in Like, it's built in them to be rebellious, right? Yeah. I think... When the when the generation that's like coming up because the generation coming up right now is getting real close to where they kind of have everything at their yeah, fingertips, yeah, yeah, yeah. like that's going to become like the cool kid will be the kid who like hunts, fishes, hikes doesn't doesn't even yeah. have a social media yeah. like that that trend is going to happen. I really do think that there's going to be a generation relatively soon in our in our lifetime we will see a generation of kids that come up that completely reject all of this cool technology stuff that we're all enamored by right now because they'll have seen all the backlash from it and that will become and cool and freaking trendy. rule because they will all the rest of them are weak and and pathetic and that's how it'll grow that's <laughs> well so, i mean this is how I'm serious. just this is how it'll grow and dominate is because that the, the those kids will understand that and they'll yeah. realize that they have a competitive advantage totally. by not adopting all this bullshit. And I then, hope more kids figure that out. Like you know, like you're gonna have such an advantage in everything, every aspect, whatever you want to pursue. You know, if uh, if you're doing that and you're learning the actual skill of it and you're applying it and you're not just like simulating everything and doing I, that, it I, is inter It is interesting, right? Like uh, uh, you you know, having kids serve you food. At, uh, like fast food places, you notice how many of them uh, like can't give you eye contact. Yeah, yeah. it's weird. It's, it's it's annoying. It's like this is their first time doing something really in public. I think maybe, and they just they kind of look down and they don't want to like make eye contact. Yeah, and it's like, it's man, a, you've been you haven't yeah, been in front of people. I know. Yeah, you know, yeah. For a long relearn time. it all. Yeah, you know, I wonder too. Some of that, like, I mean, again, I'm being a parent, I, I like, I feel like I take responsibility for any of that stuff, right? Like, it's my job as a. Dad. It's happening to the parents too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's just these it has kids to growing be. up with it. it. It has to be, right? It has to be happening to the parents too because they obviously allow allow that to happen. I hope I hope that I'm aware of those things and I, and I te like I want to teach my son like I, I mean we already do. Like we teach him to introduce himself. Like even one of the like we there's a conversation we literally have with our my son right now. Like I mm -hmm. always ask him like who he played with and if he's like He's not, if he only played with one kid, oh, how come he didn't go meet another yeah. kid? Oh, I don't, or we ask like, oh, we see him play. What was his name? Oh, I don't remember his name. Like, well, did you introduce yourself? Like when you meet somebody, you tell them, my name is Max, what's your name? And so we teach him like mm -hmm. those things. Like I think I'm aware of that. Like I'm aware of it even at this young of an age. Like I want to implement those things yeah. early on with him. And I just think that if you do that, that hopefully he will won't be this super awkward weird kid. Maybe we do have a backlash. You know, I was just reading some data on uh, media. You know that the a majority of Americans don't trust media, and it continues to grow. This is one of the first times it's ever happened in yeah. history. Yeah, they just are now more people than not are like I don't trust what the media says. So maybe you're right. Maybe this is like a total backlash is going to happen over the next couple, of, you know, the next generation where everybody's like I'm off. Well, you see it stuff. in the numbers. I mean, the numbers aren't lying. So you'll get like your old staple like uh, TV shows and and uh, like um, your Jimmy Kimball's and these yeah. these like you know major network TV like are getting not even a fraction of views as a lot of these YouTube and podcasts and you know uh, new media. So I, I don't know, and I don't really know what to make of that either. Is it are, are, is that going to be a dying thing completely? Like once the boomers are gone, or is it like? Because that's really who's the only ones holding it up right now. Well, I I definitely know I already seen the shift in social media. Like, um, I know that uh, I don't remember. I don't. Did you, did Dom have a? Did Dominic have a uh, Instagram? Did he do Instagram at all? Or no, he he did, but he barely ever used it. Okay, I do, I do have a cousin. I'll tell you what, I have a cousin who's seventeen who got him flip phone. Okay, so yeah, and so listen, like the I've already seen the high school kids. I have a, a, a nephew who's in high school, and it's already not cool to post all the time. 
It's already not. It used to be cool. You post everything. Yeah. You document everything like that. If you want to be an influencer, it's already like the the counterculture has already started. Where it's like, if you look at most high school kids' Instagram now, it's like five photos. Mm -hmm. They put like, and they. Just I can't wait till it's cool to like get a job and be responsible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> that would be awesome. Totally. <laughs> I hope. I hope it happens in Max's we'll generation. Start promoting it's, it. Like, yeah. Yeah. Hashtag. I know. Would that be? I'd be I'd, I'd, how lucky would I be if the the, the generation, the yeah. comeback generation, is when my son's getting yeah. older and all that stuff like yeah. that? I always think about that. Right. Man. All uh, right. So uh, we should mention again our live stream uh, of when we're creating the program. You can watch it. It's on the 13th of November at 6 p.m. on Instagram. We're going to just turn on the cameras and you'll watch us create the next uh, MAPS program. Let's go. I hope that they, I hope Your we chance get a, to contribute. over 1,000 people I'd like to see on it. That'd be awesome. It'd be great. Joy Mode was created because the products on the market are terrible and they knew they could do better. This is a science-backed product. Improves blood flow to you know where. Improve your sexual function and satisfaction with Joy Mode. Go check them out. Go to draw, try joymode.com forward slash mind pump use the code mind pump get 20 percent off all right back to the show our first caller is nono from indiana no no how's it going how you doing? i'm doing pretty well how are you guys pretty good it's honestly an honor to, to be talking to you guys today thank you how, how can we help you so um i don't know if you can hear him i have a one-year-old on my back screaming for a ball and um i myself have been very unfit for most of my life um i can remember since i was about 11 or 12 um just with with good intentions in mind destroying my metabolism so i started an eating disorder and in the last six seven years and then from there just it, I remember trying to fix that and gaining about 70, 80 pounds in under a year. And since then, um, it's only gotten worse. So COVID, just before COVID, I finally got good habits. And then um, when the pandemic happened, I cr just everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And since watching you guys, now I feel like I know what I need to do, but then with life being so crazy, we're consistently moving, um, been married three years and we've had five addresses in those three years. And um, we just finished another move. I'm probably going to start work soon. I want to have good habits for me and my family, kids, husband, all of that so that coming back from vacation or um, just breaks in life don't make it as difficult to get back on routine. Um, especially considering, like I said, for me, I would figure out a good routine and then, and, and then, you know, some life change would completely destroy it and I'd gain 30 more pounds to my already overweight weight. Um, so I think the question is based into two things, things that based into divide into two parts, things that I can do now for the smaller kid, you know, the one year old and any other smaller kids, because most of he's a very, very active, very strong boy. This kid will pick up a three pound plate, walk across the room because he thought I needed it. Um, or so but most of what he'll do is play and cardio. And I feel like he's too young for me to be asking, but it seems like, you know, we talk about strength very much on this channel. So, you know, what do I do to incorporate good kinds of exercise and just healthy habits as he's this tiny. And then by the time they get to my age where, well, not my age now, but they're early teens and preteens where they're very susceptible to their looks and comments people make and things like that, that could set them on well-intentioned, but very bad journeys. So how do I introduce them to fitness, to working out when they're like 10, 11, 12? Cause I know a lot of gyms won't let you on the floor until you're like 13 and, um, 
So between that time, say they are active, what do we do? Thank you. Yeah, no, great all question. Right. Um, all right, so <clears throat> you said you know what to do um, in terms of your metabolism, and you've been listening to us, so we're, you're kind of getting the objective steps to take. But more important than that is the why. The, the why you do what you do is far more important. Now, what you do is important as well, but the thing that plays the biggest role in your ability to stay consistent um, is the why. Now, <clears throat> as a mother and a wife, uh, you probably have a strong desire to nurture and care for your family. And that comes from a very good place. Um, you want to also take that and turn that in to yourself. Now, you, part of the question was, what can you do for your children to show them or to teach them good habits? Nothing's going to influence them more than how you are with yourself, yeah. right? So how you are with yourself, how you talk about your health, uh, the attitudes you have around food, you know, they hear things like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm getting too heavy or I don't look good in this thing or I can't eat that. Well, why not, mommy? Because uh, I, I gained too much weight, whatever. These things have a profound impact on your children. Um, so how, you're gonna, how you live is going to influence them more than how you tell them um, how you live. But it has to come from a good place. If it comes from, you know, uh, a place of... Um, self-hate or, uh, disgust, um, then it's going to be, it's, it, you're, you're never, you're, or shame. You're never going to be able to stay consistent because it doesn't feel good. And although it can motivate you quite powerfully to do the quote unquote right things, it won't last very long. Cause at some point you'll rebel, which is probably what you're experiencing where you're like, I don't like, I don't want to feel like this anymore. You go in the opposite direction. Then you start to self-medicate the shame and you, like you said, you'll gain a bunch of weight or, or go down this, just this it feels like this uncontrollable path until the shame overtakes you. And then you start the cycle all over again. So it has to come from a place of care and nurture. And when you find it difficult to reflect that to yourself, uh, there's a couple things you could do. Talk about yourself, uh, by using your name. So instead of saying, I say, no, no, this helps you kind of uh, see or hear what it sounds like. And then number two, use your children because you, you have your child, you love them more than anything. And so think to yourself, would I want, would I ever talk to my child this way or would I ever want them to talk about themselves in this way? So that self-care, that nurture is going to more often than not point in the right direction. Now, by the way, this creates natural balance. Okay, because sometimes, not most of the time, this is not the case, but sometimes nurturing is you eat something or you give your kids something that's just enjoyable. Maybe not objectively healthy, but it's their birthday or they're sick and they're on the couch and you want to give them something that, you know, they're just going to enjoy eating or whatever. So sometimes that happens as well. But most of the time, nurturing looks like healthy uh, types of foods. Now, in terms of encouraging your child uh, with with exercise, it's play. It's all play. Yeah, it's all play. Hundred percent. It's that's how that's how it starts. That's how it's going to end. And then them watching uh, and observing your behaviors without you push, pushing it on them. But like right now, you're taking your kid for a walk, or as they get older, you exercise and you take them along with you, and they just sit there and hang out with mom. And then it becomes kind of a, a part of their life and they have good memories around it. Like, Oh God, I remember when my mom would take me to the park and she would do exercises and you know, it was really nice. We spent a lot of good time together. They start to develop a good relationship around exercise that then they seek, uh, um, themselves. Um, and then with diet, with your children, they eat what you eat. I think the most important thing with a, to raise a child in a modern society, like the one you live in where food is so accessible is you want to give them a little, like the feeling of um, empowerment. So you present to them four or five options, different textures and flavors, and make sure there's something in there that they do like, and you let them choose. And children won't starve. Uh, I mean, I was raised uh, by you know poor immigrants who believed that if they didn't force feed me, I'd starve. <laughs> um, and I had to kind of un un unlearn that stuff. But you put I'm the immigrant. So. Yeah. Okay. So, so you know. Immigrant. So you could put you could put in front of your kid like uh, blueberries, crackers. Like let's say they like the crackers. So okay, here's some crackers, um, some meat, uh, some rice, and some vegetables. And I know they don't like the vegetables, but I'll keep putting in front of them. And then you let them choose, and then they start to feel somewhat empowered. And you don't have to talk much around the food. You don't have to teach them much. 
And then they just, and out of the choices you give them, you know that they're, they're relatively good choices, but it gives them the feeling of having some of that, that control. Um, and that leads to a better relationship with food because they're going to be growing up in a, in a, in a, in a world where food is just everywhere. And so the, the power, the superpower you want to develop in them is the ability to, to, to choose and to say yes and to say no. Uh, but they do develop a palate at this age. And so you want to present them with different textures and flavors of relatively healthy options that they can choose themselves. Nothing we say to our children will influence them more than what we do. What you, what you do and how you are with yourself in front of them with all habits, all habits around eating, all habits the way you communicate about yourself, uh, that's going to that's going to do it all. Uh, you, in fact, you could say very little to them, I think, about I mean, a lot of people ask that about all of us are fathers and ask, you know, what do you tell you? I said, I don't tell my kids anything. I just let them see. Mm-hmm. I let him watch. I let him observe. Um, I don't force him to come out in the garage when I'm lifting weights. Sometimes he migrates out there. Sometimes he doesn't. Uh, sometimes he wants to come over and try something I'm doing. Sometimes he doesn't. I don't care. I just want him to see that his father lives that life. And then like the food stuff is like the food that's in the house is just food that I would want him to eat. I just keep it that way. And that's why when we got to an age, you know, he's five years old now. Um, I, I allow him to, to pick stuff when he goes places and he's already created such good habits around his eating because we've been consistent in our house that he can be at a birthday party. He can be somewhere where there's candy and ice cream and stuff like that. And he might partake, have a bite or that, but he has no real desire for it because I built that around his ecosystem so consistently for five years that now when he's out and influenced by other people, it doesn't have that strong of an influence because the influence I created was so much stronger on him. So what we do with our kids, uh, what we say matters very little compared to what we do. And so a lot of your effort uh, should go into you and what you're doing, and then that will bleed over into them. Yeah, I would just echo both of what Sal and Adam you know, kind of expressed. And, and for me, it's always just been an open invitation with my kids, uh, especially with play and with physical activity. So whenever they want to wrestle, whenever they want to go outside, whenever they want to go venture to, to explore, or like hike or do something like, and I might have something else in mind for the day, um, uh, I, I try my best to readjust and, and refocus it because I know that that's such a priority. That's something that I want to make sure and establish. And it's going to take a bit of work in terms of like your own um, sort of um, uh, just kind of conceding some things like I wanted to do and I want to like, you know, be productive that day or I want to do this or uh, it, it's just sort of figuring out like on your stack of priorities, like what, what really is the important thing right now? And my kid wants this and I'm, you know, focusing more on the errands or I'm focused. Like, so I've, I've learned to kind of shift a little bit more towards heavier on, um, you know, just getting that physical activity, getting that. And, and what happens as a result of that is just the whole dynamic and flow of the house, uh, is, is just so much better. Uh, and I am more productive that way. And the kids are in a better mood and we're not like, we don't have all this friction in between, um, interactions. And so that's just been something helpful and it's not easy. Uh, so, you know, it, it, this isn't just like advice. That's just like, Oh yeah, cool. I'll just, I'll do that. No problem. Like there's going to be some work there, but, uh, it's, it's so beneficial and it's, it's, it's just the example that you're laying for your kid to know that this is, this is important. That's such a great point, Justin. And, and, you know, being honest, probably the hardest thing is that, is that, uh, you sound like you're a very busy mother and a lot going on. And I'm all as all of us. And probably one of the hardest things is moments where, Oh, I just want to rest. I want to put my feet up and let him play on the iPad or let him do something like that. And I know damn well that if I engage him to go wrestle or go outside and play on his slide or do something physical, he would be all for it. And so there's moments that I find myself knowing what I should do best for him and wanting selfishly to relax. And I, and I think about exactly what Justin says, like, I want to create this environment of activity and play and not that we just, and even though selfishly I want that right now because dad's really tired, those mo- those are the big moments I think when I go, you know what, I, let's, go out, let's go outside and play, son, when I know I can kind of hand over an iPad or put on a cartoon and he'll entertain himself in front of the TV. And I'm like, that's not the culture I want to create around the house, even though I know I'm tired. That's probably the hardest moments is recognizing those and making that decision. Yeah, those, those uh, um, devices... Um 
iPads and TVs and like it's like you have to severely limit it because they're so Addicting. they're so well made um, and entertaining that if you give them the option of you know going on uh, an iPad or the, your phone or TV, they'll choose that oftentimes over anything or video games. So um, you have to really limit it, and you know, th there's a lot of data, and there wasn't much data ten years ago. But now there's a lot of data. And the experts now are saying, uh, not even to give your kid a smartphone until they're like sophomores or juniors in high school. So I, I would say like that, like, you know, my, my kids get a grand total of 35 minutes a day. We have a timer and that's it. That's the max. Anything, once that's up, it's up and we don't use anything. And then we also control what they watch. Um, and it does take more work because it's easy to put them in front of the TV so I could do other things, but that's, that's a big one. But again, I'm going to go back to the first thing, how the, why, why you're trying to change your diet, why you're trying to exercise is so important. If, if you're looking at it and you're going, I need to eat right because I look this way or because I, whatever I I'm bad or it is not, that, that is not a long-term approach. You have to do it out of self-care and self-love. And it's not the feeling. I want to be very clear. You're not going to have a feeling of love like you do for your husband, that, that, that warm, fuzzy feeling. It's a, it's a, it's a conscious choice of love. And, the, and every once in a while, you'll get that feeling, but the feeling isn't always there. So it's a choice. So you have to say, okay, how can I care for myself like somebody I care about? Uh, what would be, the, what would be the, eat the food that I would eat if I were taking care of me? Um, uh, just like for your kid, you know, you don't give your kid everything they want all the time because you care about them. So do it from that standpoint. And then what'll happen is you'll develop a relationship with exercise and diet. And, I, and it's a relationship that hey, you have to develop. So this doesn't happen overnight, but it will be a relationship that becomes long-term. No, no. Do you have any of our programs? Um, I, I, I got map starter a while ago and then I had chaos in life. I never went past week two so yes i do have map starter I, i'd like to give you maps 15 too because i think that that's a great mm -hmm. uh that's a great program it just consists of two especially if you're busy yeah especially yeah. if you're busy two exercises it's not a major commitment to being in the gym for 50 minutes an hour and i know uh i mean i found this when when max was little this was probably my go-to is like this is easy i can i can break away for 15 minutes or even two different times in the day that are seven to ten minutes to get my workout in I found that uh, uh, really, really nice. So I'll send that one over to you so you have access to that too. Okay. Well, I think what, it, just if I'm clear, because a follow-up I'd have had is how to get better transitioning from like breaks or, hold on baby, breaks or holiday or a move or something like that. And I guess um, having that strong of a why would be a good way. Say hi. Oh, he is yeah. a cute. Look at that little guy. Wow, he's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> he is adorable. So I guess having a really strong why would be a good way to get back on it, I'm thinking, because then it's not just, oh, I have to go do this thing, but then it's a positive motivation, and then I'm not going on extremes. Uh, it's, absolutely it's, it's it, so true they yeah. have stats on this you're seven times more likely to do it when you revisit the why and the purpose behind it seven times more that's a lot that's a major difference by always revisiting even that means writing it down somewhere so you have it visually somewhere in the house of why you do this why you do these things you're, and see looking at that every day you're, would be you're, smart. you your children deserve a happy healthy mama and so, uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And so when you're, when you're struggling with this and this is a practice, when you're struggling with it, remember that, remember, like I need to, I need to care for myself first off. Cause I deserve it. I I'm a human. I deserve to be cared for. And number two, because I want to be the most important thing for me right now is to be a good mom and, and mm -hmm. always revisit that, always revisit that. And it will move But don't, don't use shame when that shame creeps up. Knock it back down. No, no, no. I'm not bad. I'm struggling, but I'm not bad. It's because, uh, you know, I, I deserve to feel better. I deserve to be healthy and I'm caring for myself. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you, got, you got it. You got right, it. Good no, luck no, there. Have your hands full. <laughs> go have, go have fun. We'll send that program over to you. No, no. Thank you so, so much. I'm I, thanks for what you do because yeah, you, I've seen a whole bunch of your calls and it was one of them that inspired me to call of 
you guys showing from experience just how you have changed people's lives and mentalities and i would be listening to a, one episode and you'd say this is especially difficult for women and i know you're going to think this and i was like hey i was just thinking that <laughs> so, <laughs> so just having the date the rep, just everything you do you, you're saving lives and transforming people so thank you thank you so much god bless you thank you thank you, too. Thank you for calling thank you thanks bye what a nice woman yeah um the, you know the problem with with what we're talking about is that and this is one of the things i hate the most about our industry is the fitness industry uses shame uses self-disgust uses yep. all the wrong things to get people to buy their products to join their gyms um and so they start people off on the wrong foot now they do this because it's an effective sales tool yep. um, so i can get you to buy something by making you feel like crap about yourself and it is a powerful short-term motivator mm -hmm. it will make you move hard in the in the short term in the long term no way and this is why you hear people say I stopped, you know, watching my diet and I stopped exercising because I wanted to enjoy my life. What a crazy thing to say. It's so funny that you, uh, we got this as the first question. L right before I had walked in the studio, I was listening to a friend's podcast that was doing an interview, forget the guy's name, but he was rattling off stats. And he actually said that exact stat was if you, if finding out your why and your purpose of whatever it is you're doing. So that could be building a business, that could be getting in shape, it could be anything. Yep is so important to have clarity around that and to consistently revisit because if you do, you're seven times more likely to follow through on it. And if you don't and you get distracted or you shame or use other reasons as motivators, uh, you're a lot li you're a lot more likely to fail at it versus always revisiting, you know, why am I doing this? And so it's a very powerful piece of advice. Uh, and you know, I would, I would tell people to write it down somewhere if they need to, if they have a good spiritual practice where they pray every day or like that, like include that in it because, uh, remembering that is, is a powerful tool. Our next caller is Sarah Ann from Tennessee. How Hi Sarah. How you doing Sarah? Hello there. Good to see you. How are you guys? Good. Good. What's going on? How can we help you? Okay. So, I mean, obviously you guys have played a huge role in my life as a trainer. So the, the biggest thank you to you guys, but so here's, here it goes. So I emailed you guys about four months ago. And when I emailed you, um, I had said that I had been struggling with knee tendonitis for about eight months. So that was again, four months ago. So I've officially, I just celebrated my one year anniversary with knee tendonitis. So my question for you guys is basically, do you guys have suggestions on how to adjust my programming while also like allowing me to still kind of continue to do the things that I'd like to do and still make progress forward? Yeah. So do you know what caused it in the first place? I do. It was, um, so I had Olympic weight lift and so I'd been on, um, I've, I've been Olympic weightlifting for about two years now, but originally like I started two years ago. And obviously when you're learning, like weights are a lot lighter. So then about a year in, I changed programs and it was definitely just a big increase in volume. So that was a million percent it. But then I just, I mean, ignored it for a while. To be honest, I mean, you guys know with the tinnitus, once you warm up really good and during the workout, you feel pretty good. So for a while, it would just like bother me after the workout. I'm like, eh, you know, it'll, it'll work itself out. And then as just time has gone on, it just has never really gone away. It kind of comes and goes in like pain, but like, or I guess levels of pain. So it's just, I don't know, it's really finicky and I can't really figure it out. Okay. And have you adjusted your training um, to, to try to remedy this yourself? I have here and there, but again, it's like, here's where I'm struggling. So I'll like bring it back, say, and I tried to do like decreasing the range of motion. I am a really big believer in a full depth squat. So I did decrease the range of motion for a like about a week, but that honestly kind of bothered it a little bit more. So then I was adjusting. I wasn't doing as much Olympic lifting. Like I was kind of trying to take some of it back. I'm like trying to kind of give in like, okay, I'm still squatting, but I'm, I'm not Olympic lifting. So I've done a little bit and then I've increased things like um, more specific things, my warm up, And then I'm doing, um, some more, like just some like Bulgarian split squats. I've seen that that's really good for it. Um, so I mean, some minor things, but I think where I'm struggling is just like, I'll do it for a little while and like, I'll feel good and I'll continue to feel good, but then randomly it'll like hit me really hard again. And I just don't understand. 
Yeah, so so it's going to take a while to get it to. So here's what happens when you start to feel the pain. Um, you've already gone too far, and so what tends to happen, especially with us fitness fanatics, is we let the pain signal when we need to change things, and then we the pain goes away, and we think we're good. We go back to what we were doing before. What you need to do, uh, and I'll give you some specifics, but what you need to do is when the pain goes away, whatever made you feel better, stay on that track for a long time before going back to where you were before. Because what happens again? It's like, oh, my shoulder hurts. I'll change my workout. Shoulder pain's gone. Go back to what I was doing before. Oh, it came back. You got to stay in that kind of recovery, you know, phase for much longer uh, before you start to jump back in so that pain won't, won't come back. Now, there's a couple of things you can do in your workout. Typically, we don't advise static stretching at the beginning of a workout, but in this case, static stretching can actually help because it will somewhat weaken the CNS uh, signal to the quads a bit. And that actually helps with tendonitis in some cases. So I like static stretching at the beginning before the workout. Squats, I like box squats because this box stops the descent. So you don't have to change directions. You sit on the box, you pause, come back up. I also like the sled uh, quite a bit. So driving a sled. And then finally, uh, leg extensions, but really light and focusing on the isometric contraction at the top. So you extend yeah. your leg and squeeze really hard at the top. In fact, you could probably start your workout uh, with something like that. And then finally, I would look at any hip imbalances uh, or ankle imbalances. Uh, sometimes or oftentimes knee issues originate at the ankle or at the hip. So I would look at those two areas to see if there's any instability or, or, or weakness in those areas. Almost certainly that. I mean, and the thing that tells you that is that you have these moments where it, it I don't know where it feels like it comes. Well, that's because what happened is whatever exercise you did, whatever leg exercise you were doing that day, the, just the knee wasn't tracking uh, optimally and the knee won't track optimally if there's weakness or instability in the hip and or the ankle. And so I just can't stress enough the importance of working on the ankles and the hips all the time, but certainly before you do uh, certain workouts, uh, and then the exercises that Sal gave are great uh, ways to regress uh, the training, so there's less stress there. But I mean, the root cause, in my opinion, is going to come probably from the ankle and the hip, some some way in there, and con Just constantly trying to progress that. Continual mobility work, yeah, yeah, trying to regain that strength stability. So yeah, it's just highlighting the fact that we just didn't have a. It was instability that was the issue that you know got exposed through acceleration. So you know that yeah. that type of lifting, it's. I mean, and that's why we, we put it at the peak. It's because this, this is really where it exposes any kind of underlying issue. So you're going to need some work, you know, really just dedicated every day, like sharpening that with mobility practices. Have you, uh, have you been diagnosed with, uh, I, th I hope I'm saying it right. Osh is it Oshkud Slaughter? Slaughter? Am I saying it right, Justin? Oshkud Slaughter, yeah. Oshkud, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure how to, if I'm pronouncing that right, but um, are, it's like raised tendon of the patella. Yeah. Osh Oshkud Slaughter, there you go. Have you been diagnosed with anything like that? No, I have not. Um, and I've been to, like, I've been to, I actually used to work at a physical therapy facility. And so I had some of the PTs look me over and then I went to a, di a different physical therapy and he also, I mean, all he told me was basically like patellar tendonitis, but is that the same thing? No, I mean, somewhat. So look up Osgood. So it's O-S-G-O-O-D and then S-C-H-L-A-T-T-E-R. So Osgood Schlatter. It's much more common in teenagers, mm -hmm. but this, the 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 re, the remedies or the rehab techniques that they use for that tend to work for general knee tendonitis as well. So I would look that up online and and look at some of the movements and things that they do. But you know, I've worked a lot with. You know, there was a period there where I trained quite a few kids, uh, athletes, and they uh, so common. This was very common yeah. among them. And the static stretching, the isometrics. And then stopping uh, or, or change, you know, modifying exercises so they didn't have to switch a descent, like yeah, Olympic those lifting. Abrupt shifts in, in direction. Yeah. Y yes. It yeah. It. Yeah. And so, like box squat, like I said, box squats and, and sleds and um, you know, sled work and and, and I um, you know, long stretches in between sets, like really made a big difference. Uh, for these kids, so those are things I would uh, I would look at, but you could look yeah. it up again. Oscar Slaughter, really, yes, the kin stretch. You get the combo of the both. What he's talking about with the isometric contraction, but really like taking it through real slow range of motion. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. In, in fact, sometimes what you'll find is when it, when you start to notice that pain, 
if you could put yourself in an isometric extension and just squeeze the heck out of your quad, you might oh, you yeah. don't even need a leg. There's extension. the analgesic effect, yeah. So yeah, you, so you could sit in a chair, extend your leg, and just squeeze your quad really hard for 15 seconds. Um, and then kind of move around, and you'll notice the pain. I mean, this is, uh, for me, if I'm you, this is a, a, a motivation for me to invest in, like, Ken Stretch as a certification. Like, this is, the, uh, like, going... Yeah, to, being so a trainer for it's sure. A win, it's a win-win for you since you're in the field. Uh, and so, you know, not only do you need to go through a great course and certification that's only going to make you a better coach and trainer, but along the way, you could probably get down to the root cause of what's going on and really help yourself by doing that. So it'd be something I would consider. Now we didn't ask any of these general questions cause I'm assuming they're, they're the answers are probably good, but do you, are you hydrated? Do you, do you, do you watch your water? Do you have issues with hydration? Um, no, not typically. I mean, I, I feel like I'm pretty good about my water and even, um, like getting some, cause I don't. I, I feel like I eat pretty clean, so I even like intentionally try to salt my food just to get okay, some, okay. you know, some of that, some of that sodium in. But so you guys are more so suggesting not necessarily like a decrease in like volume or intensity, but more just like maybe changing, like maybe I'm adjusting my range of motion on the squat, and then I'm adding in like some no. sled pushes. Like I'm not adjusting. No, my no, 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 Replace, yeah, replace, replace volume. Get rid of the. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. If you haven't okay. already, I'm you glad should, you asked that because yeah, you would have yeah. just made everything worse. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> like oh, okay, I'm just adding. If you haven't, if you haven't got rid of a lot of the Olympic lifting, you probably yeah, should let's stick with cut, strength training. For cut a while. that out if yeah. you haven't. If you haven't cut that out, that's the first thing we got to do. I mean, okay, that, so yeah. cut it out, even if like yeah, just blank stare. Yeah, yeah gone. Uh, it's got your. It's it's like. So here's what's happening. Let me let me let me break down what's happening. Right. So you're catching a lift at the bottom. Uh, you are you're 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 going down quickly, changing directions very fast. That places a tremendous amount of of stress on the knee joint. Now, if yeah. if, if everything's good, that's okay. But if you've got tendonitis. You know, if you're catching 100 pounds, that that stopping of the weight and then reversing or stopping and catching at the bottom is a lot more than 100 pounds. It's literally like the worst thing you could do for it. That's <laughs> if you gotta go through. If the knee is not tracking properly knee, yeah. and it's telling you by what you feel, what you're feeling from it's that's like literally the worst yeah. thing you could do. An exercise. So what about instead of like instead of catching, like doing like a power clean or a power snatch? So I'm not catching in the hole. I'm catching. Up high. Yeah, any, I mean, any, I mean, maybe still not a good idea. It's just it's, too explosive yeah. for yeah, now. It's just doing anything explosive, changing directions, and catching heavy weight right now for what you got going on is just well, not here, ideal. Let me help you because I know I know what you're feeling. This is why I had shoulder surgery because I did the same thing you're doing. Uh, it, there's you have this false idea that if you stop the Olympic lifts, it's going to set you way back, and this mm -hmm. is why it's false. Your knee tendonitis is going to set you way further back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so either way, you got to take a step back. Uh, yeah. One is shorter than the other, and the one that's shorter yeah. is to take a break from the lifts. Yep. The longer step back is going to be if you you let this knee tendonitis keep getting worse, then forget Olympic lifting for maybe forever. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, Sorry, there it yeah. is. Yeah, it's yeah. okay. No, Symmetry. honestly, I need to hear it. Yeah. Uh, so, what about also because I know literature says um, that. With patellar tendonitis, it's good to like submaximally load, like eccentrically load the squat. But do you guys have suggestions on how to do that if I'm like lifting by myself, or is that even not something that you'd suggest to do? No, I just box squats are great. Mm -hmm. Box yeah. squats are great because you're going down, mm -hmm. you're sitting, set a box that's like right mm -hmm. below parallel. Real slow tempo. Slow control, go all the way down, sit down. Don't use the box to bounce. It's not like a like, you know, just actually sit down, pause, and then come back up. Yeah. And then do it again. Increase yep. your intrinsic tension. Like you can control that. Like so, you can yeah. you can intensify it like substantially. How but how many sets are you doing for your legs, and uh, how many times you're training them per week? Be honest. Um, my well, I mean, so every day. Um, oh my god. I mean, we I squat like I specifically squat definitely twice a week, but then I mean that's not including the Olympic lifts, so. You're overtrained. <laughs> I mean, a lot. Sarah, you're you're overtrained. On. Come on, Sarah. You've been listening to us for a long time. Is your sister doing this too? <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is. We're on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> you, Come on. you relay this information to her too. You're yeah. overtrained. Okay, well, then I really do have a question for you guys because I really, where I think my real issue is, like everything you guys are saying to me, I'm hearing it and I I know that's the reality. My tr If I have a client, they come to me, I would say the exact same thing. Yeah. But I think where I'm struggling more is like the psychological part of it where I just... I don't know. I'm like, I, I can't, I'm like, why can't I just tell myself it's okay to take a step back? Like, I feel like it's not. Yeah. 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 What's your that's, fear? That's a problem. Yeah. What's your fear? 
There's a fear behind this. You got to know what that fear is. You got to be honest with yourself. What's the fear? What do you think is going to happen if you if you cut your volume way down? I think my biggest fear, because like my background and Megan's background too, is like we were runners for 10 years and then we started lifting about 11 years ago. But it's like, I know that my body genetically, I'm really good for distance, like for, you know, the endurance. I think where I'm afraid is like, I feel like I have fought for 11 years for every single pound on the bar. So I think I'm just like afraid if I take a step back, then I'm like, that's like weight that I worked really hard to achieve Sarah, Sarah. for me to take a step back. You know, are you watching the series that I'm doing on YouTube right mm -hmm. now? What's no, I'm not. What okay. is it? It's on mind pump TV. It's a series of doing and the whole, I lost 50 pounds of muscle, 50 pounds of muscle in the last five, six years. And you're watching my journey of getting it back. And you, 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 the hardest part is to get to the level you're at. The work, just like you said, you fought for every inch. The beauty of this, though, is you can lose all of it, and getting it back is ten times easier. Yep. Yeah, muscle memory is yeah, a yep. real thing. You, you, it's for not sure. you. And in fact, your body is probably going to thank you yeah. for taking a break off of all this volume and intensity for so long. You'll probably take two steps back, but take five yeah. forward when you come go back. back can I tell you what's going to happen? I'll make a prediction. First off, two things. Number one, you you've struggled to gain every pound of muscle because you've overtrained the entire time. Yeah, I know this about you because you were a runner. Your background, yeah, you, you do what you can tolerate, not what's optimal. So here's what's going to happen if you take a step back and you're consistent with it. You're going to progress <laughs> further. <laughs> you're yeah. going to gain more muscle yeah. and more strength. <laughs> yeah, you just got to be okay with it. You're it's just all up here, you know. It's just got to concede. Uh, That's it. it. Yeah. That's it's it. Tough. It's yeah. really tough. So yeah. I'm not denying that. That's it. Can you um, do it? Can you do it? I mean, my. my I my suggestion is because I know you're a trainer and I know also how we all have, we all have some of this in common, right? A little bit of this is what would motivate me is the education part of being a better trainer is like, like I would go be this kin stretch guy. Now I'd be like, you know what? Like I'm going to, I want to be a better trainer. This is going to help my clients. I know deep down though, really it's for me to help me. And so I would, I would bury myself into that and become, learn all about that that's only going to support what's going on with you. And it's also going to make you a better trainer. So go all in on that. Go all in on learning all about that so you can help support your clients. And selfishly, it's going to make you better. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You know what to do, Sarah. Yeah, you can do it. we're right. But yeah. are you, are you going to do it? Yeah, yeah. Let's see you do it. I tell you what, Sarah, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have you back on the podcast in 30 days. Don't do that. Yeah, we are. <laughs> We're going to have you back on the podcast in 30 days, and we're going to check on you. Don't disappoint us. 30 whole days? The heat, the heat is 30 on. 30 days is nothing. Mm -hmm. You can do anything for 30 yeah, days. It's, it's a piece of cake. Okay, okay, okay. I can Okay, I can agree to 30 days, but I really do. Another question. So yeah. say, how long is it? Like, okay, I feel good for X amount of time before I can start, like, adding in yeah. some of the, even a light Olympic lifting. Yeah, we ha we'll, we'll have the we'll answer. Let you know. We'll let you know in 30 yeah. days. It yeah, it's yeah. not going to be within 30 days, yeah. I'll tell you yeah, that. Yeah, no. gonna, so we can uh, talk about that. Back get, in. Yeah. So uh, it's either going to be a great call or it's going to be a real tough call yeah, in 30 yeah. days. Yeah. yeah. Either dismiss the phone call or no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. No, you <laughs> I'm won't. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. We're going to have our day. assistant reach out to you. We'll schedule a 30 day call. We'll see you then. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thank wow. You. Okay. This is real accountability. I need this. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, guys. I appreciate y'all. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah, typical fitness fanatic. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, that's yeah. how I got shoulder surgery, man. I got, I started, mess, my shoulder started hurting, my AC joint. Yeah. Doctor's like, well, you just think there's like workarounds. He, yeah, oh, you bro. Know? Like, he goes like this work You, you got to take a break of jujitsu, probably not lift and bench press for so long. But what are the other options? Well, we could inject it with a bunch of cortisol. Mm -hmm. Do that. That, that, <laughs> yeah, that thing. That, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, next day I had a shoulder surgery. <laughs> I take way more time off. It's just, uh, you shoot yourself in the foot. I mean, probably Olympic lifting has to be the worst thing for her in this oh, situation. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And it's her yeah. volume too, bro. She's doing every day. I know. And then, yeah, com and then combine that with over, I would get knee tendonitis too. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's, it's, you know what's so funny? If she just followed maybe like a mass 15 program, it might all go away. Just by, probably. Redu by reducing just the volume to what she should be doing, she probably. might actually, it might just go away. But you know, what will be interesting is because she's already asking, when do I get back to that? So there's this like, oh, I'm going to take a step back. She's going to start feeling better. And then she'll go right back to the volume and intensity. It's yeah. like, yeah. you need to learn that, that you you don't need that much training and intensity. It's crazy. No, that's why I said, that's, like, that's why I wanted her back on in 30 days. So yeah. I knew this was going to happen. Hey, sorry to interrupt. It's October. Maps Muscle Mommy is 50% off. Half off. If you're interested, click on the link below. All right, back to the show. Our next caller is Justin from England. Justin, what's up, man? Hi guys, how you doing? Good. Oh, all right. How can we help you? 
So, uh, firstly, I want to, like everyone else does, thank you all for doing what you do. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, I embarked on my fitness journey around four years ago, uh, and I started listening to your show about three years ago. Um, having listened to hundreds of hours of the podcast, I believe I've built up a wealth of knowledge surrounding fitness, health, and nutrition. Uh, along with some fantastic tips on fatherhood, marriage, and family life, which I've implemented into my own. Uh, I recently took myself back to college to get my qualifications to become a personal trainer, and I don't think I would have taken that step if it weren't for your guys' inspiration. That's awesome. That's Thank rad. you. That's great. Uh, this brings me on to my question. So, recently we've been looking at the Eat Well Guide, which was f formerly known as the Food Pyramid. <laughs> Uh, and it still suggests uh, that you should kind of base your meals around carbohydrates uh, and neglecting the importance of protein and even saying things like eat less red meat. Um, do you think this is a case of Public Health England and the government being behind, or do you think they know exactly what they're doing? I think you know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Yeah, You're no, trying no. to set us up for a rant here? No, no. <laughs> it's terrible. Listen, if, if you followed the advice of the of these these Western nations' health guidelines, you would be sick, fat, and unhealthy. We, we know this. Um, you know, in your question, your, your, your question was, should you, should you say something in class? No, pass your, yeah. pass your class, get yeah. your, get yeah, your, yeah, yeah. get your certifications, then go do the okay. right thing and train your clients. Look yeah. at the, look at the, the positive side of this. That means there's huge opportunity for you in the space. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Because, it, because at that level, they're still teaching rubbish. And so you have the opportunity, okay, Adam's to go out there. <laughs> Gobbledygook. <laughs> <laughs> so you have the opportunity to go out there and teach others the right way. So, I mean, if everybody was uh, learning all the right information, then it would be that much uh, more difficult for you to be successful, and it would be a much more competitive environment. So it's a, it's a positive thing from a business perspective. Yeah, just pass the class, dude. And then when you become a trainer, just go train people yeah. the right way, and, and you're going to be good. But for now, you just got to pass the class. So just give him the answers he wants. <laughs> Once you get the cert, yeah. you'll save people. Yeah, for sure. Sure. Cool. Okay. And then just as a sign of more of a personal um, question, so I'm 35 years old, 190 pounds, 5 foot 10. I'm around 18% body fat. I'm thinking of purchasing an anabolic advance for my next program. Uh, should I approach it in a maintenance or a slight surplus? plus? My maintenance is around 3,000 calories. And then interrupt that with a mini cut in the deload weeks. Or knowing that I'm slightly over on my body fat, should I go into it in a cut? I like the first option. Yeah. Yeah, I had a feeling you were going to say that. I just kind of needed to hear it from you guys. Yeah, because what you'll probably get, you'll get leaner as you build muscle uh, in the program. Yeah, 3,000 calories is good. It's a good place to sit. Uh, sit there, lift. You could do a, a couple little short cuts uh, in the middle, um, but just try and get stronger and keep your body weight right around where it's at. And, and uh, you know, hopefully you'll get that kind of nice transfer, right? That, that nice switch of fat and muscle. Doug, you want to send him over Anabolic Advanced? Do you have Anabolic Advanced? Uh, not yet, no. Oh, we'll send it to you. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. You got it, man. Yeah. Awesome. All right, Justin. Thank you. Go pass those classes. Thanks, yeah, man. Go pass those classes, brother. We need more trainers. We'll do. All, All right, man. Take care. Adam's like, cheerio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, isn't it crazy that they still teach this absolute garbage? Yeah. It's just so frustrating. It's yeah. so frustrating. They teach this kind of stuff. And what does I mean, ours look like now? I mean, the it's, food period, it's, it hasn't it's still garbage. Much, you know, right? it's by, by the way, this is a fact. We know how heavily influenced government policy yeah. is by yeah. lobby groups um, and trying right. to kind of promote their foods and, and stuff like that. And by the way, you know, 20 years ago, uh, they didn't. We didn't have all the data that we have now. We have so much data now that shows just how wrong they are in many ways, um, and and yet they still go in this direction. It's really frustrating. And the government, I think, I believe quite strongly, the government eventually will move in the right direction. But they tend to be, you know, decades behind. Just yeah. just tends to be how it works. Yeah. Our next caller is Erica from Texas. Erica, how you doing? Hi, Erica. I'm great. How are you guys? Good. How can we help uh, you? All right. Well, first, can I give a real quick shout out to my um, personal trainer, Brian Salt, who introduced me to you guys. Yeah. Oh, right. Awesome. Absolutely loves you. And I've really enjoyed uh, 
the different programs I've run with you guys too in the podcast. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Awesome. But I sent a question in about my hip is pinching when I do barbell back squats and it's gotten worse and worse and worse um, to the point, this is kind of embarrassing, but like even getting dressed, I have to support my leg or getting into my car, I have to like hold up my leg to get in. So I kind of was doing some research on exercises and looked at, um, you know, um, different stretches with bands as far as pushing my knee across my body when I was in a squatted position, doing the couch stretch, the combat stretch, 90-90s. I've been doing a lot of that. Um, and it seems to help, but it still hurts. So my question for you guys is, I'm doing MAPS 15 right now. I love it. I'm on the second phase this started on sunday the second phase but should i ease off of squats and do something like leg presses instead or should i continue to do the squats while focusing on the mobility and strengthening of my hips if you recommend continuing would you lighten the load and increase the reps or increase the load and decrease the reps or something else altogether and then um would you recommend replacing the front squats with a different exercise in the second phase of maps 15 or just go for it yeah, good question. Let's get to the bottom of the is pitch. There, is there any way we could watch you do a squat from the side? Are you able to do this right now? Like if I can see your hips. <laughs> okay, let's awesome. check this out real quick. It is. Come on over. Let's see. Can you see me from here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Back yeah, up just a little more. A little bit yeah, more. Stand sideways. Put your arms out in front of you. And then okay. as you squat slowly, tell me when you feel it. I .e., There it is. I already see it. Yep, mm -hmm. come on up. Mm -hmm. So you have a really strong anterior pelvic tilt. Yep. yep. So that's okay. where your pelvis, it's like you're arching your back, Arch right? You're back. sticking your butt out. Yeah. So you want to go a little bit more neutral, which means we're going to have to get your core to activate a little bit more. So what's happening, your hip flexors are, are really tightening. Mm -hmm. You're arching your back and, and the, the top of the femur is hitting in the joint, uh, at the, in, in the joint socket. And that's what that pinch is. So when you do that squat and your butt is, is sticking out real strong, like that arch your back, tuck your tailbone just a little bit and tense your core. Mm -hmm. And then that pinch should start to go so away. So the pinch is in the front of the hip, not the side of the hip. And so what's weird, I've routinely had issues with my right side. It's my left side. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those people, like when you go skiing, my feet are like this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try really hard to make my skis go straight. That's okay. But they, yeah. It just, you it's know, so irritated. they've always had kind of like issues on the right side. It is on the left side, but just you think tucking my bum will just, help better? Just a little bit and brace your core really hard. So okay. some exercises that can help with that. I did a video uh, called Hip Flexor Deactivators, yep. which will okay. help. Uh, we'll send that to you. Um, okay. And on the floor, you could do, uh, you could land your back, back presses and do what press. are called low back presses where you flatten bridge. your back into the floor and squeeze your, your midsection. And then okay. this is going to sound a little co counter uh, to what I'm saying, but th this actually can help is you do single leg leg raises just by warming up the hip flexors a little bit. Okay. Where you're on your back, on your back, on the floor, one leg is in the floor and you just sure. lift one leg and do like five or six reps and then sure. try the squat again. Now it's okay to turn your feet out when you squat, by the way, are, are you trying to keep them straight? Is that part of the problem? No, um, because it doesn't work that way. I mean, I have tried in the past to keep them straight, but it, I have hardly any depth when I do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And then taking, you know, kind of the next step from that, when you get back to the squat is like in terms of the technique of it, you take a, a PVC or a dowel bar and you put it down your spine and you try your best to hit these uh, points of contact, it's like try and get your lower back to touch uh, the stick and which is going to be more difficult uh, and so you may not even get down very far, which is going to take progressive work of you being able to, uh, make sure you're bracing and, and maintaining that position with your, your lower back. Uh, and then as you progressively kind of work your way down, you're, you're trying to teach your, your body to, to, to do that on command. Uh, Dylan, was it the second video? What video was that in the series that I, that I share that I use that? That tip. I remember? saw that in your docu series. Yes, yes. Okay, good. You're watching. Hey, yes. Somebody actually watched it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You've been asking a lot. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a. I mean, uh, how often do you do like floor bridges or hip thrusts too? Do you do any of that at all? Um, I do a lot of core work. Okay. Um, so I would say, as far as um, like hip bridges, I probably do those. 
maybe three times a week. So I'll do a five. To, you, Peloton has a crush your core. Mm -mm. Yeah. Um, no, 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 no. Do weekly. yeah no no if you're hitting yeah. your abs and your core and you're busting through the reps you're probably strengthening the problem yeah you want to be able to separate the hip flexors from the the muscles that uh that flex your spine so we'll send you the video of an exercise that i do that can that can help with that yeah the deactivators does it is that there's another video we did too where we uh, you we, did is hip it, thrust okay is it yeah that? because yeah. because you could also hip thrust with an anterior tilt make yeah. it worse yeah, so you want press to you hip it's important when you do floor bridges or hip thrust that you do the back press first which you yeah. get on and, and we've got videos on this where we're your knees are bent at 45 you're going to have a natural arch and i know someone like you you're going to be able to put your whole forearm under your low back that's how much it, and that's how you know yeah. how much of a tilt you have and we're trying to get rid of some of that right so you're going to press the back flat against the ground. You'll feel the core engage, your abs tighten up to hold that position. Then from that position is where you thrust up. Right. And you have to maintain the core being tight and your and your pelvis rigid like in that position. And that's and you want to go slow, controlled, pause, uh, j just a handful of reps. We do not want to be pumping this out fast because you'll default to your other pattern. So two things, that's the floor version. And then you can just throw yourself back on the uh, wall and do that vertically. So, you know, you do our, our sort of uh, compass test where we're, we're doing that, that zone one test. Yeah. Against yeah. the wall and, and really trying to press actually, our whole body into the wall. I did that on the third or fourth video in the series. So you see me on the, on the yep. third or fourth and you see me trying to tilt that do the exact same thing. I have the same issue by the yeah, way those two so things yeah i had this was a, this was an area that i had to work on the cool news is you can fix this you can absolutely fix this and eliminate that pain you have completely but it's how you perform these movements that's going to be crucial and you're, you're going to want to take your time get to the place where you can control that and i think if you're doing a bunch of core and ab work like it sounds you're doing a lot you're probably actually making it worse by the type of stuff that you're doing and you should probably regress the, the core exercises you're doing and do more yeah. like the, if you're following a, a core class where they're like you know crunch 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 move to this move to that don't do that this okay. has to be very slow yes. and very controlled because we're trying to change a recruitment yep. pattern yep. if we go, if we're going through we and a pattern. yeah if you're like a peloton class where what's happening is your body's moving the way it's always moved and it does it very well uh, mm -hmm. which but you're actually strengthening the imbalance we need to change the recruitment pattern a little bit so it's gonna be slow and deliberate so what would you do for core work? Just what you're talking about yep. now? Yes, you're going to get, get great core work from that. Yep. It's gonna You're going to find it very challenging to do that and to hold that position through yeah. the movement. So, and that's, I would want you to, to pause at the, like you back press, core's tight, go to the top, squeeze the squeeze glutes, hard. squeeze the core, the hold, intensity. hold for like five seconds. I mean, you're going to do like five reps, slow, controlled really concentrating on keeping that uh, you're you're in that position through the entire movement versus doing 15 20 reps and you can intensify it by doing like a hard isometric contraction so you can make the five reps feel challenging for the core by intrinsically tightening it up versus trying to do a bunch of reps well even like when i drive i try to push my back in and keep the keep the core engaged just as an extra that's good little yep yeah, that's good that's mm -hmm. very good mm -hmm. Um, so then as far as the back squats, would you continue to do that with the weight? Would you wait till the hip gets better? Would you do all of this in si simultaneously? You could, do it si you could do it simultaneously if you prime properly, but mm. I would go lighter on the reps. You could even try elevating your heels a little bit. This will shift the, the this will shift the, the, the weight a bit and then t just tuck your tailbone mm. a little bit. I try to tape your, your squats, you know, just so you could, I would video yourself. You know, just to make sure your technique is sound and you're bracing properly before you, you start loading. Put her in the forum. Are you in our forum? No. Oh, okay, get in our forum because yeah. you could post these squats. With, there's so many trainers in there that can help. Yes, yes. You post the videos like you of you working out, and it, you'll you'll know you're on the right track when you do some of these movements that we're talking about, and then you go over and perform the squat. It'll feel better. It'll, it'll feel it'll, different. It'll yeah. It'll it'll start to feel. You should feel the progression, and that's when you kind of know you're on to like, oh, I need to do that. I need to do yeah. more of that more often is like that's those of them and so you sh you can squat while doing it but what we don't want to do is to keep squatting and ignore all the work that that's you need right. to put in, in into that for sure kind of it's very similar if you're watching this series it's very similar to what i'm dealing with the shoulder you see me really working around the chest and i got to do all this kind of priming before and so i'm doing i'm mm -hmm. still training 
But I, that becomes the priority first is setting my shoulder up in that position so it's tracking correctly. It's actually a really similar problem. I just have the issue in the shoulder. You have it down in your hip. But the way I'm working around it is the, the priming and stuff is the foundation and making sure that the shoulder is tracking right before I even consider loading it. Otherwise, I'll load. In fact, the one I recorded yesterday, I went and did not, didn't do enough priming, went and loaded it. And right away, I could tell in the movement, like, oh, it just doesn't feel right. So I went back to doing more priming stuff because I got to get the shoulder tracking right. Same thing for your hip. So your recommendation would be to video when I whenever I do the squats and and look at that to make sure yeah, I'm use, doing it correctly. and you and use the forum use that's why we're that's one of the the most popular ways people use this forum is they will they'll video their stuff and then say hey what do you guys think uh, if it's getting better or worse and, yeah. and then, uh, just and for to, your, to look at progression. Yeah. Right? And for yourself. So you could like, you, oh, you're like, oh my God, that felt really good. Mm -hmm. Seeing it helps like reinforce like, oh wow. I noticed that I did this. Like, so it's, it's good practice to do that. Cool. Awesome. Well, that's great. You guys. I mean, I was kind of thinking, what the heck did I do to myself? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing. It's yeah. just a recruitment Re pattern yeah. and they can totally get fixed. Yes. You can fix this. Great. We'll, well see, that's great. I appreciate it. We'll see you inside the forum, Erica. Yep. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I, I this uh, is relatively common. I've had a few clients. I had it. Yeah, it was. It was, a, it was oh, you too. Oh, also. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like you nailed it. It's an anterior pelvic tilt yeah. like that, and all the core and ab stuff. Which you'll read that that's what she should do is strengthen her core and abs. But that's the problem with that advice yeah. is then people go you're do circuit it. classes yeah, yeah. and all stuff, and then you're just reinforcing yeah. that pattern. And it's and you're not. Solving. And the challenge is with this one. The reason why this one's so hard for people is because you're taught to have a straight back, shoulders back. Have this kind of strong arch in your back as you squat. Right. So people are like, what are you? I'm doing everything Tall I'm supposed chest, to. But then they compensate. Yeah, you know, and they have this so. really strong arch, and it yeah. causes that hip uh, that hip impingement. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. Thirty percent body fat for men. This is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from thirty to ten. What is ten percent body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from thirty to ten percent? Yes, it's possible. But not if you guess along the way. So we're going to talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now, there's a huge range, right, of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher.